Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us on Making the Argument. We've talked a lot about the various philosophies that have, um, we'll say, influenced, if not infected, certain areas of American culture to include American academia, media, Hollywood, etc. But the thing we're going to discuss today is a very, very interesting interview from 1984. And believe me, as you're listening to this guy talk, you're going to think, was this like yesterday? No. No, it wasn't. 1984, he gave the speech. So it is an interview with Yuri Bezmenov. And Yuri Bezmenov was a journalist with the USSR. We're going to get into, um, with the Soviet Union, we're going to get into some of his background, his history, what he did, how he defected the United States, and what he had to say to Americans about warning us on what had already happened, what was happening, and what was going to happen. And I guarantee you, you're going to want to hear what he has to say. All of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument. If you haven't already, head down to the description of this podcast, whether or not you're on Apple or Spotify or here on YouTube with us. As a reminder, we're also streaming on Rumble. So if you prefer that, head over there. We are streaming there today as well. Every episode is streamed on Rumble, in addition to the Making the Argument channel on YouTube, as well as the Nick Freitas channel. So we appreciate you being here. Head down to the description, join our community chat, say hello, introduce yourself. We would love to meet you there. All right, as always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates. But other than that, a reasonably okay guy most of the time. Most of the time. But somebody might disagree with that as my beautiful bride, Tina, 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 Queen of the Bees. We're just throwing around the new nicknames here. We Hello, are. everyone. I do, I do love it, though, when like people will see Tina like around town now and be like, oh my gosh, Queen of the Bees. All right. And then, of course, our political prognosticator. That happen. It does happen. Political prognosticator and resident historian, Christian Hines. I am so hyped for this episode, despite the fact that I got zero sleep last night. He was, <laughs> it, Christian has been geeking out about doing this episode for a while now. I, I'm going to admit I was too. Uh, however, our producer, our producer, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. I, I got. Fine sleep last night, so I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't. We we were all we were all sitting around talking about you know doing episodes and what we should do. And and uh, Christian was like, yeah, we got to do this one on your the interview with Yuri Bezmenov. And I'm like, yeah, this is pretty cool. So we, we sat there and like Christian and I are sitting there watching it like popcorn. Like this is so interesting. Hamilton, isn't this interesting? And Hamilton's like, yeah, this is this. Yeah, hmm, yep. You you did think it was interesting. I, I did but. think it was interesting. I was preoccupied with some other projects. That's but. true. Yeah, Hamilton's always like constantly working on different things and the technical aspect and other creative. So like Christian and I are the ones that are try constantly trying to distract him and get him to go down the rabbit hole of you know YouTube philosophy. But anyways, let's talk a little bit about why this guy is important. So like I already said in the uh, in the introduction here. He worked uh, for the Soviet uh, paper Novista. I'm gonna I'm just by the way, uh, no sorry. Uh, Novistia, Novistia Press Agency. And um, I'm going to screw up some of the pronunciations Just on this. Just say it with a Russian accent and you'll be Novis fine. Novistia Press Agency. He worked for them, which was, he describes his front for KGB. <laughs> but uh, what he talks about, and, and what, he, what he talks about is the work that he did as a journalist um, for an organization that he describes as, in many respects, a front for the KGB or a front for you know, essentially Russian, pro Soviet propaganda. And the work that he did internationally, things that he did over in uh, India when he was stationed over there learning um, languages, and also what he did uh, with respect to academics coming from the West, coming from India, coming from other countries that the, that the Soviet Union was interested in influencing and helping to you know, develop them or... or um, basically developed kind of he said brainwash was yeah he said, he said word. he said brainwash but I, I think the other what he talks a lot about in this is again bringing academics over having the soviet union pay for all these really nice elaborate trips um and then going back and essentially teaching these things within the universities within their home countries so that was that was one element it was the academics like another russian mind control oh my gosh tina i was joking with nick that this episode was going to be about russian mind control and then he goes through and gives me the entire you know, rundown of what of what we're we're talking about, and I said, well, so basically, Russian mind control. No, no, it not okay. Russian mind. No, wait, stop. I'm going to finish this first <laughs> before we get off on this tangent. So it was it was his interaction with academics that he was bringing over. It was his interaction with basically uh, student leaders or whatnot that they were they were kind of training to essentially as assist in the potential destabilization of other countries. And it was also Western press. So it was members of the media from other countries that would get, you know, very, very limited access to the Soviet Union. And his job was to make sure that whatever they reported on was reflected favorably 
um, in, in the press as a result. So we're going to talk about all of that today. But the first thing that we want to do is actually just kind of do something of a react video on listening to Yuri kind of give some background on what he was doing. So where this starts off is he's explaining um, what happens when he, he essentially kind of gets back from India, his time in India. Um, and he is, he is working for the press agency and he's approached by the KGB about some of the work that he's going to do. And he, he talks about that right here. So let's go ahead and start playing that. And we'll go through and just give some reactions when appropriate. A Soviet boss. And on, you're on the right. I'm on the right here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was the occasion was commissioning of the refinery complex in Bihar, Barauni. Uh, back in Moscow, I was immediately recruited by Novosti Press Agency, which is a propaganda and ideological subversion front for the KGB. 75% of the members of the Novosti are commissioned officers of the KGB. The other 25 are, like myself, co-opted agents who are assigned to specific operations. In this particular case, you can see me talking to students of Lumumba Friendship University in Moscow. Um, this is the a, a huge school under the uh, direct control of the KGB and Central Committee where future leaders of the so-called national liberation movements are being educated and selected carefully. And some of them have absolutely, they, neither this for example is a group of students from Lumumba. They don't look like students at all. They look more <laughs> like military and that's exactly what they were. They were dispatched back to their countries to be leaders of the so-called national liberation movement. Let's go to pause this for a second. So it, 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 obviously he's, he's talking about some of the work he's doing with students and how they're training to be student liberation or liberation front movements in other country. And there's a reason why if you look at these various you know, elements that always operated in Central America, South America, Africa, portions of um, Southeast Asia. It's amazing how so many of them had people's liberation movements somewhere within the title. And sometimes there'd be multiple organizations working within these countries. You know, again, for those of you who don't know some of my background, I, I was an Army Green Beret. I was special operations. So we, I actually worked in insurgency and unconventional warfare. And insurgency is when, counterinsurgency is when you're working with the government in order to, in order to stop you know, an insurgency or a terrorist organization, or mainly in insurgencies. Unconventional warfare is when you're actually working with the insurgents to overthrow the government. So to give you just a quick example of this, what the U.S. was doing with the Northern Alliance when the Taliban was in charge of uh, Afghanistan early on in the war, that was us engaging in unconventional warfare. And then when, and again, I'm not saying, I, I served in Iraq, not Afghanistan. But then once we you know, once our allies and whatnot took control of the government of Afghanistan and now we we're fighting against the Taliban, which was, you know, you know, out of official power, that was conducting counterinsurgency operations. So it's kind of two sides of the same coin. But what he what he's pointing out here is that a lot of these, you know, educational trips from students that were coming from other places, this this wasn't this wasn't because they they really wanted to understand more about how, you know, Soviet scientists did math. It, it was it was primarily ideological in nature, and one of the things he talks about earlier in this uh, thing is how the vast majority of spending on subversion was not the sort of like cloak and dagger James Bondy KGB agents, you know, assassinating people or or stealing microchips. It was actually this. It was bringing people to the Soviet Union, developing like leadership. Um, so that they could go back and, and essentially push Marxist doctrine within their own country, whether it was through legitimate means within academia or the press, or whether it was through other means through insurgency movements, et cetera. Can I give a, um, a, a concrete example of, of this type of thing in action? I actually wrote a, a grad school paper on this, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, what, what happened in Afghanistan in the, in the mid 1970s before the Soviet invasion, um, there, there had been Afghanistan used to be a kingdom, and it was actually a liberalizing kingdom. The, 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 the king wanted to turn Afghanistan into basically a representative democracy, but he had a cousin that staged a coup d'état against him. This is like in the early seventies, and he took over. And this guy, his name was Dayut Khan. He became the new president, aka dictator of Afghanistan, and he had this brilliant idea that he was going to send all of his students to. Um, get their education, their higher education at universities in the United States. And he was going to send all of his army officers to get their military training in the Soviet Union. Does anybody here or in chat want to take a, a shot in the dark at what happened next? 
I know I know a little something. It, about I, what Nick is not allowed to answer this because he actually knows. It, Tina or Hamilton, do either of you want to want to take a guess at, at what happened next when you send your entire army officer corps to get their training in the Soviet Union? The that, military Russian no, mind control. Close. Very, very close, actually. In a stunning turn of events. Yeah. The military staged a coup d'etat against their own government. You don't say. And ushered in a communist Marxist dictatorship under the, the head of Taraki and, and Amin, who became the uh, first two Marxist leaders of the, the, the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. And then, lo and behold, um, Taraki ends up being overthrown by Amin and executed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, and, the and revolution I, eats its own like they normally do. When, and I can tell you right now, a, a key part. So again, one of the primary missions of Green Berets is we worked by, through, and with the local population. We did a lot of training with foreign military. So I've trained everyone from Iraqi scouts to Korean special missions group to Bangladeshi border guards. And part of what we talk about, there, there, is, there is always a, like a part of the training that you actually take them through actually goes through like, ethics and the importance of civil liberties and things like that. So there, there is, even when the United States does these exercises, and we used to call them J sets, I think they call them something else now. And there's obviously other methods too, but we had foreign students coming through the special forces qualification program. We had foreign students coming through ranger school. So it's not like the United States doesn't do similar things. The difference was, is that when you, when you, you can go and look at the, the ethics component of what we train, we can look at the civil rights component of what we train. So there, there's a, cause there's always been a big scandal of, are we just training, you know, foreign dictators or the militaries of foreign dictators. All I can say is we, we do put some effort into trying to say, hey, there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And then the vast majority of the training is actually based off of how do you effectively carry out military operations. Whereas a lot of the Soviet training of foreign militaries was heavy, heavy philosophical indoctrination. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah. They, they did not just teach the, the Afghan officer corps you know, how to, how to organize a division, right? They, yeah. they, they taught them Marx and Engels. Oh yeah. Yeah. Big time, <laughs> big time. All right. So let's go ahead and keep watching. To be translated into normal human language, leaders of, uh, international terrorist groups. Another, uh, area of activity when I was working for the novelty was to accompany groups of so-called progressive intellectuals, writers, journalists, publishers, uh, teachers, professors of, of, of colleges. He, you can see me here in Kremlin, I'm second on, on the left, with a group of Pakistani and Indian intellectuals. Uh, most of them pretended they don't understand that uh, we are actually working on behalf of the Soviet government and the KGB. They pretended that they are actually being guests, a VIP intellectuals, that they are treated according to their merits and, and, and their intellectual abilities. For us, they were just a bunch of political prostitutes oh to be taken advantage for various propaganda operations. Therefore, you can see perfectly well the senior colleague of mine on the left doesn't really have that much respect on his face. Here, let's go ahead and pause and this real quick. I, I want to talk about something here because this, really, this is really important. Part of the training that we actually go through um, in special operations is talking about, there, there's, for instance, when you're captured, there's, there's two things that they attempt to try to do with, with prisoners of war. One of the things they try to do is gain information. But honestly, most of the information that you have as a POW is very, very limited in, in scope with respect to the usefulness of the people that have you. So unless they've specifically captured you because of your information on a, on a high-tech program or something like that. But as someone like me, like a Green Beret, right? Let's say we're out on a mission, I get captured by the enemy. What am I going to tell them within a, you know, three weeks from now that the, the team knows I've been captured, right? They're going to, they're going to change protocols. They're going to change what they do. They're not, so my, the value of the information that I have to them is very, very limited with respect to operational use, very limited. So what's the second use they have for me? Propaganda. And, and one of the things that we really got trained in was understanding how you can be used for propaganda in ways that you never anticipated. And so, you know, there, there's certain things I can't talk about with, with respect to that training. There's other things I can. But to, to give you an idea of this, because this is all something you could research. I'm not, I'm not giving you anything new. Something as simple as you being in a picture with other people and pointing at something, right, or, or looking at something can actually have very, very powerful propaganda use. Because they could always 
you know, change the picture around and something like that. And what are you pointing at? Well, now all of a sudden, like you were, you were just pointing at something on the table. Well, now they've put a map on that table and they, now it makes them, now it makes it look like you're collaborating with them. So one of the things that was always important to understand was, is that how, how easily you could be used for propaganda if you weren't mentally prepared for understanding how that would take place. And so it's interesting for him to talk about how they were using these guys in part for propaganda because it wasn't just about training the ideological component of this. Um, it was, it was also about being able to use them to be able to demonstrate that, oh, look, we have all these people that is respected intellectuals in other areas and look at the nice things that they're saying and look at the nice things that they're doing. And so all of that, all of that was a, the, the propaganda wasn't always as obvious as what I want people to understand. What I find so fascinating is that he's explaining here basically how the left, and I mean the really far left, right? The Marxist left co-opted the intellectual class in many respects, right? Like, like he, he said at the beginning of this segment that, you know, a lot of these people are, are mostly progressive leaning academics and intellectuals. And, and, you know, we, we bring them into the, the USSR and we pretend like they're, you know, esteemed experts. And that's why they're being invited when in reality, they're being used as, as a political tool. They're, 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 they are literally Lenin's useful idiots. So it's basically you can use somebody's ego against them. So Absolutely. If, you, if you like just really massage their ego. If you were trying, if you were trying, so you'll, you'll also notice when he's going to talk some more about this on the things that they did while they were there. W one of the things, cause I also used to, used to have a top secret security clearance, right? And, and one of the things that they would look at for whether or not you were eligible for a security clearance is financial. Like, are you someone that's in a lot of debt? Another thing they would look at is, do you have any proclivities that could come back to haunt you? Right. Do you have any? And so a lot of that had to do, quite frankly, with like sexual stuff and things like that. So those were those were two things. It was it was always like financial. Like what what were your vices? Because if you had a particular vice that could get you into trouble, which is to say uh, enormous amounts of debts or pictures you didn't want to be seen or whatnot, they could then work you as a source as a result of that. So you going over to another country to be an academic and next thing you know, they're taking you out to a party or something like that. I mean, there could be all sorts of things either that you do because you're drunk or because they know that you like it or because they- Well, and put, they use honey pots, right? Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll use attractive men or They're women. They're going to go full Eric Swalwell on you. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay, one other thing. I got a question. Um, how do you convince the American public that this is not just another instance of red scare, but an actual threat to the foundations of liberty and civil rights in America? That was from Life in a Nutshell. That's a great question. One of the reasons why we're doing this episode is because I, I think it provides a certain degree of credibility when you have somebody that formerly worked- in this, in this world, you know, back in 1984 saying, yeah, these, these were the things that were done. And, and these were the processes that were used in order to infiltrate and influence. And then we're going to, we're really going to get into the specifics of what he describes as active measures. And so this is, this is no one here claiming that, oh, this is all the secret, you know, the USSR is coming back. And no, this, this, these are competing philosophies that we see going on right now. And this isn't us claiming that the KGB did it all or anything like that. It's just saying, Here's another piece of information that is interesting to consider when you look at what's going on within our world. That uh, I'll, I'll end with this before we we get back into the um, uh, the video of, of Bezmanov. But like we all kind of have our own theories on on what's at play here. But Nick and I have been talking for for several days about this because we've both been excited for this episode, and I think we're more or less on the same page with with what we think is going on here. And it's not actually as conspiratorial as, no. as you might think. It's in some ways it's kind of benign. It well, in, in a lot of ways it just it makes a lot of sense based off of what were the objectives of of like what were the objectives of the Soviet Union at the time? Because again, when this interview was done, the Soviet Union still existed. You didn't Paul Samuelson, who was one of the, the leading economic influences within the United States in, in, in US academia, was still predicting in 1984 and, and beyond that the, the USSR was going to eventually overtake the United States economically. So this is... Right before it collapsed. Yeah, yeah. We, we were not at a point right now where all Americans were just convinced this was going by the wayside. And so he's explaining what were the strategies of the Soviet Union and what were the strategies of those who are interested in perpetuating Marxist ideology. And it's worth mentioning that the, the perpetuating of Marxist ideology did not cease in December 1991. 
when the, when the you know when when the hammer and sickle was lowered from the Kremlin and the Russian tricolor was raised in its place, just because the Soviet Union disintegrated did not mean that all of the stuff that was being pushed in terms of propaganda, mm-hmm. right, in terms of active measures, that didn't just vanish overnight just because the central organ and body that well, was well, pushing it had disintegrated. For instance, if the United States abandoned overnight, does that mean that nobody ever again would ever be interested in? constitutional republics or democracy or free market economics. No, of course not. No, right? I, I would say you'd probably more energized for yeah. it. But anyways, let, let's go in and let's go in and get to this. I, I know there's a question from Bossy out here. Bossy, I promise you we will bring him up. We'll bring up Antonio. Don't worry. All right, let's go. A very skeptical f- smile, a uh, typical KGB sarcastic smile, anticipating another victim of, of ideological brainwashing. This is how a, a typical... Uh, conference in Novosti headquarters in Moscow look like. Uh, th- sitting in the middle is Boris Burkov, the then director of Novosti Press Agency, high-ranking party bureaucrat in the Department of Propaganda. I am standing next to a famous Indian poet, Sumitranandan Pant. Uh, he was famous because he was an author, he was the author of a famous poem titled Rhapsody to Lenin. That's why he was invited to USSR and everything was paid uh, by the Soviet government. Uh, pay special attention to number of bottles on the table. This is one of the ways to kill the awareness or curiosity of, of foreign journalists. My, one of my functions was to keep foreign guests permanently intoxicated the moment they land at Moscow airport. I had to take them to the VIP launch and toast to friendship and understanding between the nations of the world, glass of vodka, then the second glass of vodka. And in no time, my guests would be feeling very happy. They would see everything in kind of pink, nice color. And uh, that's the way I, I had to keep them permanently for the next 15 or, or 20 days. At certain point in time, I had to withdraw alcohol from them so that some of them who are the most recruitable would feel a little bit shaky, guilty, trying to remember what they were talking last night. That's the time to approach them with all kind of nonsense, such as joint communique or statement for, for Soviet propaganda. Uh, that's the time they are the most flexible. And of course, what they didn't understand, they didn't realize or pretended not to realize, that myself, who was drinking together with them, uh, was not drinking at all. I had ways to get rid of alcohol through various techniques, including special pills which were given to me by my colleagues. Uh, but they were taking it seriously. In other words, they, they, they would consume quite a large volumes of alcohol and feel quite uneasy next morning. Um, in 1967, the KGB attached me to this magazine, Look Magazine. A group of 12 people arrived to USSR from the United States to cover the 50th anniversary of October Socialist Revolution in my country. From the first page to the last page, it was a package of lies, propaganda cliché, which were presented to American readers as opinions and deductions of American journalists. Nothing could be far from truth. These were not opinions. They were not opinions at all. Uh, They were the clichés which The Soviet propaganda wants American public to think that they think. If it does make any sense at all. It sure does, because from the viewpoint of the Soviet propaganda, although there are some subtle criticism of the Soviet system, the basic message is that Russia today is a nice, functioning, efficient system, supported by majority of population. That's the biggest lie. And of course, American intellectuals and journalists from Look magazine elaborated on that untruth in various different ways. They intellectualized that lie. They found all kinds of justifications for telling lies to American public. Um, this and, is excuse me, it was partly your job to make sure that they got these ideas yes. and accepted them as their own ideas. Right. Actually, even before they arrived to USSR and they paid astronomical sum of money for that visit, uh, they were submitted, uh, the, this Novosti Press Agency developed so-called backgrounders, 20, 25 pages of information and opinions which were presented to the journalists even before they bought their tickets to Moscow. 
they had to analyze this situation and judging on their reaction to that background, the local Novosti representative or local Soviet diplomat in Washington DC would assess whether they have whether they be given visa to USSR or not. Oh, so but they were selected ahead oh, of time. Oh yes, they were, they were pre-selected very carefully and uh, there is not much chance for honest journalists to arrive to USSR and to stay there for one year and to bring this uh, package of lies back home. This, for example, is a centerfold of the, ty of, of the Look magazine. They presented this monument erected by Communist Party in Stalingrad as the symbol, personification of Russian military might. And they said in the article, which is published on, on the site, that Soviets are very proud of the victory in the Second World War. This is another big myth, a lie. No sensible people would be proud to lose 20 millions of their countrymen Let's pause in this the for war, a second. which was... So I, I, I think what's I think what's interesting, one, one of the main interesting points of this is that, you know, obviously when people come to the United States to engage in, in journalistic activity, they pretty much it, it's not as if we have, you know, some sort of centralized you know place within our media, within our government that is analyzing whether or not a foreign journalist can come to the United States and report. Um, and when they do, we don't we don't monitor what they say or what they're allowed to, to, to leave with so much. We certainly don't do a great deal of, of monitoring of their travel or anything like that or, or dictating terms on where they can go. But something was very different about when you went to the, the USSR, right? So when you went to the Soviet Union as an American journalist or a Western journalist, um, you, you, were, you were usually assigned escorts, guards, whatever it was wherever you went, right? And it's not as if you had freedom of movement to go wherever you wanted to go whenever you wanted to go there. And it was interesting how many of them, whether it was, whether it was people like, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the guy that just, the name just escaped me, not Lincoln, not Steffens, but um, uh, Durante, uh, Will Durante and whatnot, who ended up losing, I think, his Pulitzer uh, when he was stationed over as a correspondent within, uh, within Russia during Stalin, Stalin's time and, and the famine in Ukraine and, and whatnot. Um, but the, the Soviets were careful on who they identified that could come over to the country in the first place. They, they wanted people that they thought, based off of their, their intellectual position or their writing or whatnot, would be easy to manipulate because they were already coming predisposed to want the Soviet model to work. That was the famous, I think, Lincoln Steffens quote, I've seen the future and it works. And it works. Yeah. yeah. Um, or, or Durante when he was talking about how you know, Stalin had really done a lot of great things in Russia. And unfortunately, there were some things that, you know, hey, look, a, you know, revolution's not a picnic. You know, bad things happen. But oh, on the whole, uh, well, on the whole, Stalin was, was butchering people and murdering the kulaks in, in Ukraine. Um, but he just kind of ignored all of that because they had a, a, a political ideology that they wanted. And this idea that if a journalist was brought over, they were allowed to see everything or they were living in the same shoddy conditions that the Russian people were is garbage. They were treated very well because they were useful as a propaganda tool. And if you're going to be useful as a propaganda tool, well, then obviously you're, you're going to be limited on what you can see, what you can report on directly and, and how your correspondence can go out. You know, keep in mind, this is not, this is not today where it was incredibly easy to get out information. We're talking about reporting that took place over the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, where it was actually much easier for you know, a, a totalitarian state to be able to monitor the sort of communications that you had going out. If you honestly believe as a member of the press or, or as a visitor to the, the USSR, your phone calls were not being monitored, you're an idiot. And it's not like you could pull out your burner phone and, and have a separate conversation. You either had to have cleverly linked up with elements of foreign embassies where you could do things like dead drops and stuff like that in order to get information out. And the moment you got caught, you could potentially be executed. So, so there was the, the Soviets were very, very good through the press agency on selecting who got to come into the first place, monitoring what they got to see while they were in country, and then being very, very careful with respect to the information that they took out, at least while they were there. And then if there was any desire to potentially come back, right, which was another thing, is, is this going to be more than one visit? Well, then obviously you're going to be really careful about what you're reporting all throughout that time. So even as you're, because it's not like they stayed there for this entire time, got back to the United States and then finished all the reports. Reports were being written and submitted and published. So they had a great deal of influence over what was going on. And, and Americans were supposed to look at this as, oh, well, this is just an objective understanding of, oh yeah, we, we have all this American propaganda. And we did, we had America propaganda too about the Soviets, but it, it made it easier for the Russians to convince Americans that, no, no, everything over here is going good. This is just a different system, and it may not be your system, but, but there's nothing morally deficient about our system. It's just different, and in fact, we think it's better, and here are the reasons why. 
And then when you have American journalists that are reinforcing this, let me ask you something. Did the Russians have the same? Would, did, did the Russians, were they hearing journalistic reports about the real story of what was going on in the United States? Or was the image of the U.S. and the West very, very carefully guarded with respect to how the Soviets heard it? So, so the, this whole idea of choosing which intellectuals were allowed to come over and what was their potential value to the Soviet Union and Marxist-Leninist ideology. Right, so for anybody that looks at this and be like, "What's the big deal? The Soviet Union's gone. Who cares if it's gone? They still had a Marxist-Leninist ideology that they were adamant about, and that people to this day are still adamant about. And they did a lot of work laying groundwork within, you know, our educational systems. And and to Bastiat's point about um, Bastiat's point about um, uh, Antonio uh, Gramsci, he actually he, he was in he was in Italy at the time. I, I'm just do this real quick because Bastiat's asked about it twice, and I, I want to be polite. But he was Ex- one of the, explain who he is he, and how he was. He's he was a he was a a communist. Um, he was part of the Italian Communist Party. Um, you know, uh, Mussolini locked him up, especially because Mussolini went from being part of the Socialist Party over to you know fascism, which was more a form of national socialism. And um, Gramsci actually did some of the the major groundwork through a lot of his writing when he was in prison on the whole concept of cultural hegemony and the idea of the the role that intellectuals play within society. And and he really thought it was important that the way that you challenged uh, the West and the way that you challenged capitalism was not just politically or militarily, but the way you did it was intellectually. You had to set up countercultural uh, hegemonies, right? You had a, separate institutions. You had to infiltrate those institutions, not just at the higher academic levels, but all throughout your, your trade unions, your public school system. Um, and, and that was the way that you would eventually get a capitalist system to move toward a socialist system was by creating a, essentially a, a counterculture. Some people have even called it um, cultural Marxism and things like that. And, and that would be a replacement for what already existed. So this wasn't about just passing laws or military power. It really was about infiltrating all elements of media, Hollywood, entertainment, and whatnot in order to push a particular agenda. And, and a lot of times, not overtly, just very, very subtly with respect to the language that was used. And so it became this, con- it became the new common sense. And so you look around at what's going on right now and you look at what Yuri's describing and what Antonio was trying to do and all of a sudden, and you're looking at this going, this is insanity. No, it's insanity to you. It makes perfect sense to them because they're operating as, I guarantee you, if you're going up in San Francisco right now, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, they the, all believe what Antonio Gramsci wrote about, yeah. even if many of them don't even know who he is. Yeah. Gr- Gramsci, we did an episode what a month or two ago on on uh, what Wesley Yang called the successor ideology, right. Gramsci in many ways is the intellectual grandfather of of what what Yang calls the successor ideology. Yeah, because what what Gramsci got to and what I, I I think the KGB really picked up on is the idea that you know what violent revolutions don't always work, mm-hmm. especially in stable, successful, growing economies where people are getting wealthier with time. They're they're not going to be disgruntled with the state and say we're going to take the you know pitch you know pitchforks and torches into you know into the streets and, and stage a 1917 style revolution. Instead, you need to undermine the system from within. Well, and create this this you know counterculture that you said that, that this proletariat culture. When and when one of the most important things to understand about this is uh, Paulo uh, Freire from Brazil um, developed kind of the notion of critical pedagogy and popular education. And if you if you look at American textbooks within the universities for for people that are going to get their teaching credentials, critical pedagogy is is quite popular within the American university system and explaining how teachers should teach. And it, and it is all built, it is all kind of, you know, fundamentally built around Gramsci, around some of the stuff that, that Yuri's talking about on how do you, how do you shift uh, cultural norms within a society toward socialist objectives? So again, when, when we talk about this, the impression is not, it's not to give this impression that, oh, there's a secret little cabal of people that have designed, but like any other philosophical movement, political movement, there, there are people within that movement that have been highly influential in developing the, the practices, the concepts, the ideas, the applications, right? And, and so all, all of that is relevant. So let's, um, let's do this. We're going to watch a little bit more of this, and then we're going to jump to the, the discussion on active measures. Do, do we have another link to this, or are we just going to— No, no, we're, we're going to go through a little bit more on this because a couple more things he talks about that I want to get to, and then we're going to go straight into active measures, which is— which I think when you look at active measures and you and you understand some of the things that we just talked about with Gramsci and whatnot, all of a sudden a lot of this, okay, this kind of makes sense. 
Right, so let's go ahead and keep watching this. Started by Genosse Hitler and Comrade Stalin. <laughs> That's and paid worth by mentioning American that multinationals. Hitler and Stalin were allies before Hitler backstabbed them. of monuments with disgust and sorrow because every family lost father, brother, sister, or child in the Second World War. Yet American journalists who were trying to appease, to please their hosts, presented this picture on the centerfold as the symbol and personification of Soviet national, uh, they call it Russian national spirit. And it was greatest, greatest misconception and, and a very tragic misunderstanding. Of course, Look Magazine was not distributed in USSR. The main uh, audience was in the United States. But uh, I presume that many Americans, millions of Americans who were reading Look Magazine at that time, had absolutely wrong idea about the sentiments of my nation, about what the Soviets are proud of and what they hate. This is a group, you see the same lady with the sword, in Stalingrad. This is the group of journalists. Myself is in the center with the same devilish smile. And Mr. Philip Harrington is on the extreme left there with, with his camera. Uh, this is the gentleman which was so deaf or so uninterested in what I had to say to him. Uh, this is the same picture, a blow up of the same, of the same picture. Uh, many, many guests from various countries, in this particular case from Asia and Africa, were taken by me as a Novosti Press Agency employee uh, for a tour across Siberia, for example. We would show them typical kindergarten, you see, nothing special by American standards, just nice children sitting, eating their breakfast or, or lunch. Um, what they could not understand or they pretended not to understand that this is an exemplary kindergarten. This is not the kindergarten for average person or average family in USSR. And we maintain that Let's illusion. Let's go ahead and stop there. In their yeah, and, and I, think, I don't think this really surprises anybody. I mean, we, we kind of see this in modern day North Korea where they, they have show villages um, that they Potemkin demonstrate. villages. Yeah, Potemkin villages. They have essentially, well, that's what they are. They're show villages. It's the idea like, oh, look, look how great everything is right here. Because again, they're not going to take a bunch of diplomats and academics on a tour of the slums, right? That's that's not going to happen. And since you don't have freedom of movement, and, and we've actually talked to people that, that visited North Korea, and, and it was amazing how every single thing that they did was completely tracked. Scripted. It was scripted. It was monitored. It was escorted. I mean, it, you did not have... The, but the reason that that, that that just absolute propaganda that the North Koreans put on display does not work is because, A, we have enough defectors from North Korea that can tell the real story, and B, we have enough... Uh, evidence on our own hands, right? We have like satellite images and stuff like that. We have photos and videos. We have enough proof to show that North Korea is basically a, a third world hellhole, right? That it's not this this socialist communist utopia. But the problem is, is that at this time, this interview is being given just a few years after the the height of the USSR in terms of their political and economic and cultural yeah. power. He's Besmanov is giving this interview at a time when major American journalists and and news correspondents were were as as you said Nick making really bold predictions about how oh well the future is heading towards a convergence of the West and the East and we're going to end up adopting some quasi socialist model we're gonna we're gonna be learning as much from the Soviets as they're going to be learning yeah. from us and like that was the that was the belief in the early 1980s. That, that that was the future. And we know that ultimately that's not what played out. But that doesn't mean that the propaganda behind it, as we said earlier, just just died out with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Well, and again, when the reason why he's obviously focusing so heavily on the Soviet Union is because that's where he came from. The Soviet Union was still prominent and considered the primary uh, the, the primary mechanism for advancing communism within within the world or, or even socialism. And it's important to understand here. This is this is one thing we've talked about before. People like to try to go back and forth. Oh, communism and socialism are two different things. Okay, well, Marx seemed to like to use the terms almost interchangeably. Lenin tried to come up with some sort of idea that socialism was a step on the way to communism. And so I think it's, I, I find it fascinating that people will, act, like I will, I will sometimes come on and say, what socialism is, is not free healthcare and free education and jobs for everybody. What socialism is, is the abolition of the private ownership of the means of production, right? It's the, the ability to actually own factories and companies and things like that. You can own your toothbrush, 
right? But you don't get to own these other stuff. That's what socialism is like. No, 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 that's communism. And I'm like, I know I'm talking to someone now that has no idea what, what, the, what the actual history of this, this theory is both politically, economically, and socially. So it, it, it's important to understand that when we talk about communism, when we talk about socialism, the, the similarities are far closer than anything that separates them. Um, so, so just don't let people get away with this idea that these are two completely different political philosophies. And we want democratic socialism. I was going to say. Which democratic socialism, all that means is, I mean, think about this for a second. All democratic socialism means, as opposed to revolutionary socialism, right, where it's like we're going to violently take over and then establish the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? D democratic socialism is, no, no, you're living in a socialist state where, where we've where we've abolished the private ownership and the means of production, but you still get to vote. You get to, you get to vote on everything. And the final step is there's no government at all because again you just have the dictatorship of the, the proletariat. The state will wither away. And, and because we won't need it anymore, we'll just share all these resources because there's so much abundance. And that's why they get away with this whole idea of real socialism has never been tried. I'm like, well, every attempt at real socialism has led to some pretty bad outcomes. I don't know if we can handle the real thing. <laughs> I so. can can I say one thing to the whole democratic socialism nonsense there's the, the name itself implies that there's some sort of really bad stuff going on there think think about this if socialism itself was such a great ideology you wouldn't need to slap the democratic label on front of it mm -hmm. How many times have you heard people say, well, I'm a democratic socialist? When you bring up an objection to, well, look at what the Marxists did in the Soviet Union. Yeah. Or look at what the Marxists did in Southeast Asia. Or look at what they're currently doing in China right now. Yeah. And then you say, well, I'm not one of those people. I'm a democratic socialist. What's the difference there? If socialism was so great, you wouldn't need to qualify well, yourself well, as saying, oh, well, I'm a democratic okay, socialist. Well, let's, even, let's even say that what they want is they want the socialist system, but they want people voting for it instead of being compelled into it through force. Okay, fine. How how does that make it morally? I'm going to, I'm going to explain what I think. My problem is this. If the government is actually put in charge of every sort of mechanism of society, which gives life meaning, i.e. your work, your education, your healthcare, your objectives, all of it, like the government essentially owns it. What are you voting for? You're just voting for different people to manage a system, which you are now confined to and have no way of really getting out of. I, that, that's like voting for your prison guards. I'm sure some prison guards are nicer than other prison guards, but you're still in prison, right? That, that's the problem that I have with this whole concept. But let's go in and get into the active measures component because this is where we really get interesting on, okay, what was, the, as the Soviet Union is looking at, how do we influence not just the United States? Here's the other thing that I, I don't want to be like this, you know, kind of conspiratorial sounding thing. This wasn't the USSR focusing exclusively on the United States and going, how do we get them? This was the USSR's approach to any you know, society that they either looked as adversarial or potentially one that they could subvert and, and bring within their sphere of ideological, if not political and military influence. All right. And, and look, when you word it that way, all of a sudden it doesn't sound so crazy. I, uh, we're a country. We have certain objectives. We have certain political philosophies. We want other people to adopt them. And here's one of the mechanisms that we're going to use to do that. So let's go ahead and get into the whole concept of ideological subversion and active measures. Go ahead. Uh, process, which goes very slow, and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result? The result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get okay, rid pause of them. That real quick. They are contaminated. So, so there, was, there was a little part here that I want to see before, and that's where he gets asked about active measures. What are active measures? And he talks about the active measures as being a component of ideological subversion. And so the first active measure he's talking about is the whole idea of demoralization. How do you demoralize a society? Which is interesting because he's not talking about 
okay, how do we figure out where all their military bases are so that we can conduct an effective first strike? Like, how, no, 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 this, essentially what he's talking about here is, and, and he has another lecture where he talks about this more with Sun Tzu, where it's the highest level of, the highest level of conflict is when you can defeat your enemy without engaging in military operations. In fact, that's considered the least effective, least efficient, most barbaric way of, of defeating an enemy. The best way to defeat an enemy is when you convince them that you're not the enemy and they submit. Right. So when they talk about what's the first stage of demoralization, well, it's, it's 15 to 20 years. Why? Because that's the amount of time it takes to educate a population. And what he, what he goes on to talk about a little bit is this whole idea of they, they need to be inundated with this particular, this political worldview, this social and economic worldview with, with very little counterbalance to it. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were to go into a modern university system in the United, or Martin University, somewhere in the United States, how much exposure do you think you would get to free market capitalism as, as an ideology? You're, you're going to get, people will say you get a lot of exposure. They're walking around with iPhones and, you know, you know, shirts and Starbucks coffee and all. Okay. But they're all being taught that's, that's part of an evil system. I'm talking about intellectually, ideologically, how much time are they getting in things like the importance and value and morality of yeah. free market economics versus centrally planned economies, democratic socialism. I mean, what's, how much would we guess? Well, even during my time at Liberty, which is well known as a conservative university, uh, there wasn't much time being spent talking about free markets. Now, had I been in an economy course, maybe so, but not generally. Well, and so that's, this is an interesting point because when I, when I went to college, and I went to college a little bit later in life, and I, I want to share this story real quick because it, it kind of had a profound effect on the way I thought about these things. I was sitting in a class, and it was an English literature class, and it was the second English class I had taken at, at a community college, right? So I'm sitting there in Northern Virginia Community College and in an English literature class, and he gives us the Communist Manifesto to read. Of course. Because nothing says English literature. <laughs> yeah, like, right. like, a, German, why is like it, a German communist. Why, why is it, real quick, that every single college course required reading Communist Manifesto, but not a word from Bastiat? Yeah, well, like, so, so let's, let's get into this real quick. And, and here's what I found interesting. Because this was the second English class that I had had where there was such an emphasis on what I would have described as progressive political or social thought. So what you had was professors that were not necessarily experts within the fields that we were discussing, but they had the authority because they were the ones running the class. And so it was assumed by a bunch of students who might not be taking subsequent history class, which may or may not have a little bit more of a, a nuanced view of some of the stuff, who would not be taking economics classes where there might be a more in-depth discussion, even if it wasn't necessarily favorable toward capitalism, right? It was an English class. And it was kind of peripheral. It was one of many assignments that you had. So we, get, we sit down and we read the Communist Manifesto. And we come in the next week and the college professor goes, all right, now that you've read the Communist Manifesto, what do you think of capitalism? So I, which I thought was an interesting question. Yeah. Because he wasn't talking about prose. He wasn't talking about sentence structure. He wasn't talking about the, you know, what do you think about like, capitalism? It, it sounded like he had the intention of that experience changing their minds. Well, and the, stu the student raises his hand and he goes, I think capitalism is what is destroying this country. Now, keep in mind, at this stage in my life, I'm like 30, 31 years old. I got a wife, three kids, a mortgage, a full-time job. I'm just trying to get done with college as soon as I can so I can get that little degree because I still grew up being told you got to have a degree. And I had all this Montgomery GI Bill money, so why not spend it, right? And, and he says that, I'm like, all right, I can't let this go. And so I just raised my hand. I said, I just got one simple question before I go forward. Can you please give me the definition of capitalism? And he goes, well, capitalism is this rigid-based class system where the people at the top hoard the resources. And I said, okay, wait one second. I said, I understand that that's like Marx's caricature of capitalism. I said, but can you tell me what the actual definition of it is? And the professor immediately jumps in and goes, well, can you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's, it, it's a system where the, where the means of production are owned privately and exchange generally takes place Voluntary voluntarily. Exchange. An economic system, you know, focused on voluntary exchange. So pri private ownership of the means of production and private property and, and voluntary exchange through, to mutual benefit. And he goes, okay, we can use that. Like, 
what do you mean we can use that as if like that that was that's a pretty decent sum up of what what capitalism is as a theory had you not been in that class every other student would have had that view of capitalism potentially Yes. Well, now, well, here's what was interesting is for the rest of the class, then he then broke us. He broke up the class into capitalists and, and communists. And we had to we had to defend these various things. And it was interesting because the, the student and this that, is an English. This was an class. English literature class. And then the student that was defending communism, the student that I talked to before, I'm like, OK, so now that you know what what capitalism is. Why do you have a, a problem with it? Like what it, and he goes, well, I'm not a communist. I'm just saying that the truth is somewhere in between. I said, okay, great. Here's my question. In capitalism, in layman terms, I have stuff, you have stuff. I have talents, you have talents. We can engage in voluntary exchange to mutual benefit as long as we both agree to it. Within a communist system, essentially the government entities own the stuff, decide what the, the production levels will be, decide what the emphasis on production will be, and then they decide who gets what within that system with very little input from you and I. So what part of this would you like to trade for this? And he goes, well, well let me give you an example. He goes, my friend tried to publish a book. And the bottom line is there's no way he's going to be able to publish it because there's so few publishers that kind of control the, the entire process. And I said, no, your friend could publish the book right now. He could go on Amazon and publish yep, it. Self-publish. He, he, could, he could do all these other things. What your friend wants is the benefit that those publishers bring to the exchange. And what those publishers bring to the exchange is getting your book into several bookstores. It, it's, it's running through an editing process. It's helping improve on the final product. It's marketing for that book. So he wants all these things. And what these, what these publishers have decided is your friend's book is not worth it. And so now what you're saying is, is well, that's wrong. Well, why, they, why should they be compelled to use their time and resources and expertise that they developed over time in order to push your friend's book if based off of their expertise, they don't think it's... Now, he could self-publish and prove them all wrong. But no, you want That's the benefit hard. of something without paying for it. Yep. But I got, a, I, got, I got a question for your friend. Does he want to give up the book? Does, does, does he want something for, for the book sales? Or did he do this for free and altruism? Well, no, he wants to get paid. Okay, so that's all this is right now. And, and, it, and it was just interesting that by the time we got done with the class, we had a lot more capitalists in that classroom because it was the first time they'd actually heard an actual definition with the admission that, look, people are flawed. People will make bad decisions. They'll be greedy. They'll do mean things. But they'll do mean things in capitalism or socialism or communism. The difference is, is that when they do it in communism, if they're a member of the Politburo, they're controlling, they're helping to centrally plan the economy, which is affecting millions, if not billions of people. Whereas if you and an individual make a stupid, greedy decision, it, you might have bad results. But that, and you might affect the people that are directly around you that have chosen to do business with you, but you don't affect necessarily the entire economy as a result. You, you don't accidentally kill 10 million Ukrainians. Yeah, that's always, that's always a positive of, of, of capitalism. So anyways, I, I share that story just to say that you know, what he's talking about on this whole demoralization. If you had a room full of students in there who the only reason why they're sitting in, in, a, in a nice, wealthy area of the United States in an air-conditioned classroom, getting to take all these classes as they drink their, you know, $9 Starbucks and, and, and chat on their iPhones is because of the very system that they're now being taught to denigrate and they're not even being taught anything about what they're going to actually replace it with. Right, so this is this is what is feeding into what he's talking about right now. And they didn't get in an economics class, although you could have. They got it in an English class. And so that's that, the point: is there are no other class. Like nobody is teaching anything uh, about free market, you know, or capitalism in any other class. You actually have to go and seek that out. Well, but, if they do, but it's all from the a classes negative. are totally offering marks. If they do, it's from a negative component. What they will take is, is the worst. What they will take is actually examples of cronyism and then claim it's capitalism. Or what they will take is uh, examples of people like Bernie Madoff is like, this is an example of, you know, laissez-faire capitalism gone nuts. And it's like, no, it isn't. This is, this is, this is an example of someone engaging in massive fraud and fraud being a bad thing. But if someone drives drunk, we don't say, gosh, well, this is, this is the problem with automobiles. This is the problem with roads. If we didn't have roads and automobiles, we wouldn't have drunk drivers. You don't, you don't come to that conclusion because it doesn't make sense. The two things are not necessarily connected. We have, we, have this free, we have this system which works amazingly well and efficiently, and some people will, will, uh, will do bad things within that system. 
But that doesn't mean if you change it out for a communist system, they don't do bad things They'll anymore. They'll continue to do bad things. They'll just be grasping at power and do it from a position of power. And, what then, and then use propaganda to cover it up. Yes. Right. Speaking yeah. of the propaganda, what I find so fascinating about this story is that it's kind of evidence of the truth of what Bezmanov here is talking about. Like, like him saying that, you know, we're having Marxism pumped into the soft heads of, of students, right, with no pushback. And we've raised generations of them going back to the 1960s to believe this type of stuff. And now they've grown up. This is in the 80s, him saying this. They've yeah. grown up and they're now taking up positions within academia, within the media, within Hollywood, within corporate America, within all these institutions. Yeah. And, and there's no pushback. And, and so, like, that's how you get a situation. I mean, that kind of answers the question that I had earlier. Like, how do we have Marxism, how do we have Das Kapital being required reading in an English course, but nothing from Bastiat? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, that that it, that really goes to the truth of what, what Besmanov is speaking to with how it's – these ideas have just infiltrated – Certainly every single factor of the education system, but it's gone beyond the education system at this point. It, it's, well, it's seeping out into society because it's been in the education system now for a couple of decades. Yes. I, they call this cultural Marxism, right? Cultural Marxism. But it's amazing. When you say cultural Marxism, people automatically accuse you of being a fascist. Right? The, the term was coined by a Marxist. <laughs> That's why I'm using it. I mean, let's that. just, let's just That's get that why I'm out of the way right now. You can call it whatever on earth you want to call it. I don't really care because especially the people that keep calling me fascist, they, they freaking called Mitt Romney a fascist. I, yeah. I'm old enough to remember Barack Obama saying Mitt Romney's a fascist because he wants to cut funding for Big Bird. And then he got reelected on that, right? So I don't really care what the left has to has to label me with. Yeah. But but the, the fact is, is that cultural Marxism is basically being marketed to people now. And, and there's no pushback to it. And it's... Well, we, we got a question here from... Um <laughs> sweaty fat guy <laughs> question <laughs> nick how do we remove these people from the education apparatus that's so, a great question so here, here's what i would say i i and i get i get what you're you're going with this i i almost think it's i would look at it a little bit differently and and here's what here's what i mean by that this has been happening and becoming overwhelming since it, it really started becoming more prominent during the 60s um and then now it's gotten to the point where if you go into a sociology department and you've got 20 professors, maybe one of them will be slightly conservative. And by slightly conservative, I mean they they voted for the independent candidate when you're in 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 school, right? Or or when you're in um in the presidential election. You go into economics departments and you got 20 professors, maybe two or three of them will be more conservative, depending on the university. But on on average, that's what you're looking at. Overwhelming ideological dominance by the left in economics, sociology, uh um psychology. Certainly the arts. Yeah, the arts, uh, all of that it overwhelmingly uh, left wing and its ideology. Now it changes a little bit when you get into more of the hard sciences uh, to some degree, but, but even then your overall cultural campus is overwhelmingly left wing. And we know this, so there's no question. We know this, the left doesn't even really, you know, um, on their more honest days suggest it's any other way. Now you, you, when you say, how do I remove those people from the apparatus? Well, again, I still believe in the free exchange of ideas. The question is, is how do we insert more people into academia that are willing to actually take up those positions? And can they even get a position? So I, I would say what we have to do is apply the same free market principles that we suggest are good for everything else in society. Well, why wouldn't they be good for education as well? Why wouldn't we want more of a competitive market instead of just this one kind of overwhelming system and, and dominance? And so I think what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to create other institutions. And you see that with things like Hillsdale, with Grove City College. Uh, you see that with Liberty to some degree. Um, you, you set up competitive organizations and institutions which are teaching something differently. And when those students perform better, that speaks for itself. I would say the other thing to strongly consider when you're talking about it, because when I talk about cultural pedagogy and popular education, yeah, that's going on at like Penn State right now. If you're a teacher going through Penn State trying to get your teaching credentials, to your, your degree in order to get those, you're, you're probably getting critical pedagogy and popular education as part of your curriculum. Okay, now we, we could sit there and fight against that at Penn State, but what are you going to do? Are you going to say, I want to completely remove it? Well, now you look like a book burner, right? Or you say, well, no, I, I just want more diversity of thought with respect to the curriculum. Well, you could do that and you could try to fight that thing. The other thing you can do is you can remove your kids from the situation. There is the one thing that you can do that you don't got to ask permission for. And people will say all the time, yeah, but it's difficult because we rely on two incomes. Or I get all of that. I'm not making light of any of it. But what I will say is 
if you're trying to change these institutions from the inside, that can be difficult, but it's still a worthwhile goal. But just understand, it requires a lot. It requires a lot of uh, intense overtime. He said 15 to 25 years, right? And it's been going on longer than that in the United States. One of, one of the ways to beat them at this game is to stop playing it. Pull your kids out. That doesn't mean you don't stop fighting for, for better you know, education. But the question, the question I have for you is that if your kids go through 12 years of that, and then another four to five years within a university system, while you're fighting to change it, they still went through 12 to 16 to 17 years of this. You've lost them by that point. I mean, yeah. and they're going to be the future voters. So, And if you want the higher education component, there are options yeah. that aren't far left wing. But at this point, people just want that name of the school. Yeah. They need that school so they'll deal with everything else. Yeah. And I, I think that it's a terrible mistake. And we are, we are moving more and we are moving more and more into a realm where the degree doesn't matter nearly as much as it used to. That doesn't mean it doesn't matter, especially for certain fields. All right. But it doesn't matter nearly as much as it used to. I, I will tell you right now, when we're looking at hiring for technical jobs, for video editing jobs, for content creation and stuff like that, I'm going to be honest with you. I could care. I couldn't care less if you have a degree. What I want to know is what are your capabilities? And so I, I think that's one of the ways that we kind of combat a lot of this is that we focus on how do we develop capabilities and people that are able to operate well in society rather than constantly battling over these institutions. Some, some institutions are absolutely worth having the fight over. Others, you just want to create competition because honestly, that's kind of what they did to us and some of this. All right, so this is demoralization. Let's keep, let's keep watching. They're programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind, even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid of society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of the uh, of, uh, United States society. And yet these people who've been programmed and as you say in place and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept, mm -hmm. these are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Pause. Uh, yes. Pause. <laughs> this, is, this is the part where, I mean, we shouldn't be laughing because it's what he just said no, is horrible. it's hilarious. What he just said is horrible, but what he's essentially saying is, is that the, the first part of that, which I think was so important, was this idea that it, it's you can drop all the facts and information and authentic information that you want on them. It won't matter because ideologically they've been looked to view the world so much differently. And what do we see this? The same people on the left that will tell us, follow the science. will then put up a thing on the Smithsonian that say that the scientific method is a, is a concept of whiteness. So at the same time that they're telling you it's the thing that you should follow and ignore any of your other instincts, experiences, even ignore the analysis that you're receiving with, with whatever, the same thing they're telling you is just like just sacrosanct. It's now racist over here if it suits it. And when you point this out, the response is not to be like, oh, yeah, I guess that's kind of a good point. We yeah. should probably reevaluate. No, it was useful to make this claim over here to the overall objective, which was do what the state is telling you to do. It and, is, it was, yeah. and it was useful over here when it was there to demoralize people into believing that, and oh, by the way, everything is built upon oppressive class systems, which are designed to you know harm marginalized groups to the benefit of the ruling elite. They do the same thing with biology. They do the same thing yeah. about when life begins. They'll call you a science denier for your views on climate change um, because they don't exactly fit theirs. But then they themselves deny science when it comes to biology and when life begins. I mean, the, the, the best example that I can think of, other than the one that you gave with the science, is... I mean, think, think about how the left leverages the war on women mm -hmm. until suddenly women no longer have an actual oh, definition. Women and now don't they even exist are waging category. war on yeah. women. Other than, I mean, I, I love the whole argument that a woman is anyone that identifies as a woman. What you've just said, the whole process of identification is to identify. Is, it's is just to, a costume. It's to, well, wait a second. It's to explain 
or, or point out the unique characteristics or attributes of something which distinguishes it from everything else. But if you're now saying that womanhood is nothing more than something that you can identify as, what you've essentially done is erased any of those attributes, any of those attributes whatsoever. And, and as Besmanov said, you can, he, he said, I, 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 I don't know if, if we've gotten to this yet or not, but but he, he says that, like, I could take one of these people, bring him to the Soviet Union, and show them the concentration camps in person, and they still will not believe, right? Or, or they, they still will not see the truth. That is, is like, the, 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 the end state of the demoralization. It's, mm -hmm. it's where you're bombarded with so much information that you don't actually know what is true at that point. What? And, and what I love is that, that the solution that he gave is actually spot on to yours for the question that you got earlier of how do you remove these people from the system? It's not necessarily how you remove these people from the system. It's more how do you remove your children from being indoctrinated by the system? Because he said the way that you fix this problem with all these Marxists that occupy all these positions within all these institutions is you need to raise a new generation of people that believe in the free market and believe in, in the principles of individual liberty and constitutional government, not socialism, communism, and state control. Well, there's two more. The one thing I kind of disagree with them on is this whole idea that it's like, it's too late. It, it's too late. Once the, once those people have been through that 15 years of education, when it's too late, it's they, they believe what they believe and no amount of information. But then he goes on to say the one thing that will convince them is that all of a sudden when they get kicked in their fat butts by, you know, the, the, military. Basically they slam headlong into reality and, and it's like, oh my gosh, this was a lie. And what he's also saying is that at that point it's too late. And, and this is amazing because what happened to Trotsky? Trotsky was one of the, the primary movers and shakers within the uh, original you know, Bolshevik rev revolution. But then Trotsky also had a line of, of intellectual honesty and consistency, which Stalin was not tolerating, right? Which Lenin was not tolerating. And so what, what he's pointing out is that what these people are good for, these people that cannot process information in, in an intellectually honest or consistent way, what they're good for is destabilization, demoralization. Okay, but the way the, way the interviewer said, but what happens to them after the revolution? He's like, oh, they get shot. What, what do you mean they get shot? He goes, well, they're not useful after that. They're useful in the demoralization and the destabilization. But once you move on to the other categories and now you actually have to build a working society, you can't build a working society based off of this. They have to go because their role is demoralization and destabilization. They're not useful for other things. And, and if you look at the history, and he actually gives examples from Afghanistan and other places where the, the Soviet model has worked this, you have a revolution, they take over. Then the, the revolutionaries are always the next on the chopping block. The revolutionaries block. are always like the next on the chopping block. That's like with Afghanistan. The, the, uh, Darut Khan got um, overthrown by his own military. Marxist trained indoctrinated military. That military installed Taraki. Taraki ruled for like six months or a year. And then he got overthrown by his his second in command, Amen, who, who deposed him and then killed him. Yeah. And then Amen ruled the country. Actually, Amin plunged the country into complete anarchy. But uh, Amin killed a bunch <laughs> of people, power. started a civil war, and then invited the Soviets in to save his regime. And the first thing the Soviets did, before they had even taken control, the first thing they did when they sent in the military was kill Amin. Yeah. And so, so the revolution killed two of its own leaders yeah. before a new Soviet puppet regime could be put in place. Well, and there, there's this quote, too. Let me see if I can find it, because I've always found it to be a fascinating quote. Um uh, probably I probably don't have it readily available, um, but it it oh here we goes. This is by Saul Alinsky. So Saul Alinsky wrote Rules for Radicals. Saul Alinsky was very involved with with I, again very convinced of of elements of Marxist ideology, um, the the working classes. Here was here was his comment, and I think this kind of perfectly sums up what we're talking about. So Saul Alinsky wrote, "I have on occasion remarked that I felt confident." that I could persuade a millionaire on a Friday to subsidize a revolution for Saturday, out of which he would make a huge profit on Sunday, even though he was certain to be executed on Monday. And so it's this, it's this concept of the, of the useful idiot. And we don't say this, I'm not saying this pejoratively, even though idiot is kind of pejorative by nature. I'm saying it more of this idea that you, you have people where they have found people that are ideological, that are idealistic, that they can convince of believing a certain thing and that they're very, very useful for the demoralization portion of this strategy, but then they become a positive impediment to the effective running of a Marxist-Leninist society. And that's the point that he's making is it's like, you, you, are, you are our friends until you are not. 
He's actually uh, Nick. Do you want to play this again? Because Bezmanov is about to give some examples. I think in this. Yeah, clip yeah. Let's go. To, let's go to keep playing. Who this these type the, of people? We'll are. run down the rest of the the, the demoralization piece, and then we're going to go into um, destabilization next. The psychological shock when when they will see in future what the what the beautiful society of equality. And He's talking about the useful idiots right now. Practice, Actually, Hamilton, could you go back like five seconds? Yeah, go back five seconds so we get this the full context. This is important. Here. What he says here. Yeah, right there. In this country. Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock when when they will see in future what the what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, <laughs> obviously they will revolt. They 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 will uh, they they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they obviously they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. Uh, here you can, you can get uh, popular like uh, Daniel Ellsberg and filthy rich like Jane Fonda for being dissident, for criticizing your Pentagon. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. Nobody is going to pay them nothing for their beautiful, noble ideas of equality. This they don't understand, and uh, it will be greatest shock for them, of course. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's overfulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans. Pause. Thanks to lack of. I, I want to point something out here when he says most of this is done by Americans to Americans because there's another guy who's a former KGB guy, Jack Barsky, who says, oh, this guy's a fraud because he was never KGB. Well, he doesn't claim to be KGB. He claims to have, have worked in tandem with the KGB as a journalist with, with the press agency that he, he discussed. But what's fascinating is when, um, when Valuetainment, when uh, Patrick, uh, Patrick Bet David, when Patrick Bet David did his interview, he actually did a really good job interviewing because he's like, oh, this guy's a fraud. He goes, why is he a fraud? He goes, I'm going to play this for you. What do you disagree with? He goes, oh, well, well, I actually, I agree with everything he said. He goes, I just don't think you can blame the KGB for all of that because he, it, it's, it's really that Americans did it to Americans. That's what the system's supposed to do. And that's do. what's supposed to happen. Like that, I thought it was funny that, again, we try to do due diligence on here before we listen to something because I don't agree, I don't agree with everything Yuri Bezmenov has ever said. He's done some other interviews where I was listening to him and we're like, I don't agree with that at all. But when he talks about active measures in the process, he's not saying this is all KGB agents or sleeper agents that are college professors. He's saying, no, we invested a lot of time, money, and effort in influencing culturally important institutions such as media, entertainment, academia. And, and, and the whole result was is we don't want KGB agents explaining to American students why Marxist-Leninism is good. We want Americans explaining to you know, students why Marxist-Leninism is good. That gets to, I, I hinted at this earlier in this podcast about how, well, just because the uh, you know engine behind it is gone doesn't mean that the momentum has has just stopped, right? There is a thing called inertia. Well, he kind of exposed what I what I meant by that. Because think about this: if if the KGB was working through active measures to try to raise a generation of Marxists in order to push Marxism in the West, particularly in the United States, and it wasn't just them. There were also organic factors. There were people that, that had become converted to Marxism without being indoctrinated by anything from the Soviet Union. They just read Marx and Engels, right? But, um, or they read Antonio Gramsci. But the, the point is, is that if the KGB had done that for, for decades through active measures and they had had worked to raise a generation of people, especially in the 60s, that then grew up and then raised another generation of people in the 80s. Well, what happens when the Soviet Union collapses? At this point, as, as Besmanov said, most of this is being done from Americans to Americans. So even if the even if it, 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 it even if the, the, the match had been lit by the Soviets, and it wasn't fully lit by them, it was only partially lit by them, but even if the match had been lit by the Soviets, that doesn't mean the fire got put out once the match got burned up. 
right? Like, like, like the Soviet Union collapsed, but this kept going forward. Yeah. It's just at this point, there's no conductor at the train actually navigating it. The train's just barreling down the tracks without anybody on board at this point, right? Because the Soviet Union's collapsed. Oh. The KGB is disintegrated. But the work that they did, that carried on. Mm -hmm. That 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 carried on beyond the existence of the Soviet Union itself. Well, well, thinking quick, about quick, this quick. way, if you had if you had an influential teacher that taught you for most of your life, and the teacher dies, does that mean everything they taught that you is goes away? That's a great away? analogy. That's no, a great it analogy. Sticks with you. It continues on. It continues yeah. to influence. You end up being, you know, the, their their life's work. Quick question. Yeah. Potentially a silly question. Why wasn't the USSR happy with just having Marxism in their own country? Uh, well, okay, you've got to you've got to understand. That's a debate between Trotsky and Stalin, right there. Actually, you, you've also got to understand Marx and Engels. Marx, the, the, the whole the whole rallying cry of the Communist Manifesto. And by the way, if you really want to understand it, you can't just read Communist Manifesto. You really got to read Das Kapital and everything else. But was workers of the world unite, hmm. right? So this was never meant to be. I mean, Marx was a German living in, predominantly in England. That this was never meant to be. If, if in fact, if you want to know how Lenin actually really got the funding and the resources to go over and start the Bolshevik revolution. It was the Germans during world war one that put him on a train with a bunch of money and guns and sent him into Russia in order to destabilize Russia to get him out of the war. The most successful yeah. insurgency operation in the history yeah. of mankind. But the whole idea was workers of the world unite was Marxism was built around this idea that the, the primary concept within the moving force within society was, was economic classes, classes based off of economics. In fact, one of the primary differences between fascism, which could more appropriately be called national socialism versus universal or global socialism was that the fascists saw the, the body politic or, or the other cultural institutions within society, whether it be like ethnicity. Like, so for Nazism, the, the ethnic component was very, very important. And, and not only that, but like um, your, your race was very, very important. That was not as true within Italian fascism. Italian fascism was more built around the ideas of certain economic and social systems, but within a common Italian culture. And so what, what the fascists were saying is, is that, yeah, we want you know, centrally planned economies and we want the government to, you know, provide all these various things and, and things like that that would be provided under communism. But we don't buy into this workers of the world unite because we think that a, a, a factory manager or a factory owner and a factory worker in, in Rome have more in common than a factory worker in Rome and a factory worker in Shanghai. Right, like they even even though these two might be at the same economic class, they don't eat the same foods, they don't sing the same songs, they don't have the same mythologies, they don't have the same stories, they don't have the same habits, they don't have the same history, they don't have any of that other unifying glue of culture. And so the the national socialist and the fascist was this idea that we like a lot of the socialist economic patterns, but we don't agree with this whole workers of the world unite thing. We don't we don't believe that the economic or class status is the predominant uh, instrument within within culture or, or history. And within, I mean, that, that's a very, very like once over the world view. I, I don't want to overly simplify. Hamilton, within the Soviet Union itself, there was actually a debate after the, the revolution and after the Civil War when they actually took control of the country. There was a debate within the, the Communist Party over, okay, do we now follow through with step two that, that Marx and Engels talk about? Do we export the revolution or do we just you know, run Russia and, and turn it into a socialist communist utopia. And there were some that said, no, we need to export the revolution. That is absolutely step two. And then there was others that were like, if we try to export the revolution right now, we're going to get crushed by the rest of the world. We barely defeated our own countrymen. Yeah. Um, and so there was a big debate between those two. And the faction that believed in socialism in one country that was mostly Stalin, and by socialism in one country, that does not mean we don't expand the, the one country, right? But it means we don't actively promote it we do if we have the opportunity he did in like say the spanish civil war but but we don't actively just invade other countries because they tried doing that in the 20s there was a war between the soviet union and poland and poland won that war the, the soviets did briefly try to export the revolution to the rest of europe and they lost they they, they they got defeated on the vistula at the miracle of warsaw technically it was the miracle of the vistula but point is is that 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 failed and that discredited to some degree the people within the party that thought now we need to invade all of our neighbors and spread the revolution the stalin faction won out which was we're just gonna have socialism in one country is the term that they use 
Like I got a question here from uh, Sky Shooter. Question: What did you learn from third phase of a special forces qualification course that will be applicable today in the U.S.? The one thing I'm going to say a lot of references to Pineland. Isn't Pineland, there? yeah, yeah. So uh, the one thing I'll say is like the phase numbers have kind of changed. I, I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about unconventional war phase and Pineland. So Pineland was the Pineland was the the fake nation that we went to in our unconventional warfare phase of special forces qualification course. And what that meant was, is they basically turned a huge section of rural North Carolina into a foreign country. And what my, I mean by that is you have all these little small towns and things. They were in on it. That, that's not to say that everybody was a role player, but they were in it. You would turn on the radio station. It would be radio Pineland. That is so cool. When, when we were there, like when we would, when we would conduct operations with our, our indigenous force against the Pineland government, right? The indigenous population that was fighting for their liberation and we were helping them. Right, you would go raid a radio station. You might use a fire truck to go on the raid. Like you, I, I mean, it was it was one of the coolest exercises you ever went on. But one of the big things that you were learning right off the bat was how do you how do you manage the objectives of the indigenous force and what they want to accomplish based off of in in, in collaboration with overall U.S. objectives. Mm -hmm. And those two things did not always match up well. And so there there was a major psychological element with respect to developing trust. Um, you know, developing um, camaraderie mm -hmm. and, and understanding that, okay, if, if we want to achieve this objective, but we can't get there, like there's no A to B line from this place to this place. Well, then how do we, how do we find a way that works within their culture in order to get to something similar? Like, let me give you an example. We had one, we had one uh, exercise that we were involved in where the indigenous forces was hiding weapons within a religious building. Well, that violates certain rules of war for the United States. So we had to convince them to move it from the religious building. Well, one way you could do it is you could say, well, this kind of violates rules of war. And, oh, by the way, your women and children are going to be in, going to this church and they could potentially be harmed if it's seen as holding weapons. And their response to that was, dude, we've been at war all our lives. Our women and children understand we're at war. We're not moving them. Mm. See, wow. we, we, had, we had applied our cultural understanding to a particular situation in order to try to get a desired end result. Well, somebody else, because I, I gave the stupid solution, right? Somebody else came in and said, hey, I, I, don't, I don't care where you hide your weapons, but I, I do know this. If you hide them in a building in town, they're far more likely to get found. What we should be doing is why don't we find the different locations that we're going to be doing ambushes of enemy columns at, and then let's find a good centralized cache location in the middle of the woods where they're never going to check, and that way, we can walk to that location totally unarmed, right? Get up our weapons, go do our operations, come back, cache them again, and go back. Mm. Wow. And now we went, we went there unarmed. We came back unarmed. There's no reason to arrest us. And they're like, that makes a lot of sense. We'll do that. So we achieved the objective. The objective was get right. the weapons out of the church. But you had to find a practical way that that worked within the culture. Now, that was a tactical yeah. solution. That was a tactical approach. The question is, how do you do this on larger ideological levels? Right? How do you exploit? So one of the ways that a lot of elements did it was through trade unions. And I'm not suggesting that everybody in a union is a communist. That's not, I'm not suggesting that at all. In fact, I think most of them today you'd find are not, not even close to that. But if you looked at different ways that, the, that um, communists would try to infiltrate institutions within the United States that had a, a decent reputation, trade unionism was one of the ways that they attempted to do it. Um, so they would find organizations that had... Um, similar objectives, even if they were small. And then they would attempt to infiltrate, operate within, eventually get into positions of leadership and influence, and then change the objectives of the organization. Why, why do you think there's so many organizations within the United States that used to be fairly benign or, or even pro free markets or pro like what we would might call American ideals of, you know, a nuclear family and the work ethic and all that. Why do we find so many of those organizations now that seem openly hostile to American values or what we would have considered traditional American values. Well, it starts within academia. If you raise up a generation to believe that those values are actually bad and they need to be subverted because they're evil and immoral. And now you're going to bring something that is truly wonderful and great in the next stage of development. You can do all of that. And you don't just do it by getting the college professor. You do it by getting the college professor, which is then going to influence the teacher the plumber, right? The, 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 um, the, the media personality, the politician, all of them. So if they've, if they've sat under at least four to six years of education where 90% of what they've received is from a professor that takes a, a far more socialist friendly, woke progressive view of the world. Well, and then you don't expect them to bring those values into whatever workplace they now end up in, whether it's the law, whether it's academia, whether it's medicine, whether it's finance, 
I mean, that just it just makes no. sense, doesn't it? Of course, they bring those values with them. All right, so let's let's keep going on this. Moral standards, as I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his then he will understand, <laughs> but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation. They muted that one. <laughs> so basically, America is stuck with, with demoralization. And unless, even if, if you start right now, here, this minute, you start educating new generation of Americans, it will still take you 15 to 20 years to turn the tide of, uh, of ideological perception of reality uh, back to normal, n normalcy and, and uh, patriotism. The next stage is destabilization. Okay, pause right here. This so we're going to go into destabilization next, but I wanted to answer a question from Marcy on propaganda is often very subtle. How can people identify the subtlety, subtleties of this type of propaganda? Let me, let me give you an example of this from, from raising kids. So I remember one time we, teen, I, was watching, <laughs> I was watching a Barbie movie with my daughters. And, yeah. <clears throat> and it was going through, and the whole idea was that the, 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 this little kingdom was based off of this gold mine, and the mine ran out of gold, and so now... It was Princess and the Pauper, Princess, and the girls loved Yeah, it. Princess and the Pauper. Princess Barbie had to be married off to this other kingdom in order to prop up their kingdom, or else they wouldn't be able to take care of their people. Because they ran out of gold. And I'm sitting here looking at this going, this is absurd. And, and I'm explaining this, I'm explaining to the girls who at the time were like, Dad, please, can we just watch? And so I did. I let them watch Princess the Proper. But we had a conversation oh, on this. Oh, you, every time they had it on, you had a little something to say about it, which I think was good. But, but they, they get to the point now where they're like, oh, Daddy, just, do you have to watch it? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they had another one, too, where, like, I, I would make them aware of what was going on. So, for instance, they'd watch a cartoon. And, like, every cartoon was about the greedy businessman that was going to destroy Fairytopia in order to build their business. And what really needed to happen was for everyone to get together and protest again. And I'm looking at this going, all right, guys, can we, can we look at this a little bit more in depth and talk about what's actually... So what I, what I did was you, you start to identify when you become aware of different political ideologies, different, you know, worldviews, you, you start to become painfully aware of when you're being manipulated through a message. And you see this all the time now when you watch Netflix or when you watch a streaming service where, you know, Gosh, episode one, awesome. Episode two, awesome. Episode three, awesome. Episode four, all of a sudden, socialist ideology starts being, oh, yeah. you know, Ted Lasso was a perfect example of this. First season of Ted Lasso Hamilton was, was brilliant. Just telling me about First this. season of Ted Lasso was brilliant. It was funny. It was great. Good messaging. Second one, they started talking about how trees were actually socialist because they grow a different, and you're like, what is this crap? And, and you get to a point after a while where you start to identify the subtle messaging, which moves on to ever more and more blatant messaging. Yep. And they always create conditions within the movie where the bad guy thinks this way and all the good people think this way. Yep. And then there's always somebody in the middle, right, who who identifies with the bad but guy. Eventually but agrees eventually, with the guy. over time, agrees with all the other good people. That's the, that's the way that you start identifying it. One of the most important things you can do is look at it in a lot of children's programming. Mm -hmm. And a lot of children's and it's shows. And adult programming as well. You've oh, it's got, uh, all over. What's the one that that you turned off, I think, like two episodes in? It's got the guy from The Office in it. What's his name? Um, and uh, immediately it was like, these right-wing domestic terrorists or blah, blah, blah. Well, and look, I, and, and, if, and if it would have been in the proper context of, of someone that actually was a right-wing domestic terrorist, I'd been like, I'd have been okay with that. Like, I don't deny that there's such thing as right-wing domestic terrorists. Clearly there are. But, th but the, the story in which they were telling it and how they were telling it, I'm like, that's a misrepresentation. And, and that's the problem. It's like more and more we get into these things where you get into – and, and if they're clever, they'll let you get to like episode four or maybe even through season one where now – you invested. Now you're invested with these characters and their story and the whole deal, and then they start coming in with the messaging. The thing is is that people 
hear people like you say this and they think, oh, you're being a conspiracy theorist. But the thing is, is that I feel like that a lot of this is organic. I don't think that it's like somebody's going to the executives at Warner Brothers and being like, all right, you're going to do this. You're going to incorporate these points yeah. at these. I think it's everything is the like checking that are off boxes. It. It's, yeah. it's the writers themselves that are doing it because yeah. they've – They've bought into everything that Besmanov was just talking about. They 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 have this worldview that they believe, and and they're they're subtly pushing it. In some cases, I don't even think that you know that it's successful when you know an ideology is successful when people are pushing the ideology without even knowing well, that they're he, pushing he, the ideology. Here's the other important thing to understand. I, I want everyone to get this, all right? Because propaganda, propaganda now has a cultural connotation with I'm trying to manipulate you to do something while pretending that I'm not doing it. So it, it's the dishonesty associated with propaganda that that frustrates a lot of people. Although that's not even a perfect definition of it. Propaganda didn't used to have a negative connotation. It was essentially ad, ad, advocating for a particular thing. But but that's the way it's been used now is because yeah, it's like been largely- Yeah, like if you don't carpool, you're riding with yeah, Hitler. Hitler. You're riding yeah. Hitler. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so let, me, let me make something very, very clear here. I absolutely teach my, now does that mean I tell my kids- um, oh, okay, but I'm not going to tell you that one way or right is wrong. You absolutely teach them I what? I absolutely teach them that I, capitalism is better. I'm just, I'm just blatant about it. I'm obvious about it. And then I don't try to propagandize in the but sense. But you give them examples and you have them explain to you what makes the most sense to them. And yeah. that's just it. It's, it's that they can logically see that one makes sense and one does not. Well, and, and that's the thing that I try to do. Like the, the big thing that we all need to understand on this is that there is an ideological and intellectual battleground. And we do have different opinions on what is correct and what is incorrect, what is true and what is false, what produces good results overall and what produces bad. And we're going to engage in that. And we're, and most of us are picking or have taken a side on that because we've convinced that a particular process is good in, in so far as it achieves good results or it's moral in its application. And we don't deny that there can be immoral applications of it, right? So I, I still advance certain ideas to my, my kids, but I don't, I don't like shelter them from, from um, counter opinions. In fact, I love talking to them about the, the counter uh, opinions or the counter ideologies because I want to be able to explain differences and why I think something is true. And then I allow them the opportunity to ask questions. But if you really want to understand propaganda, it's, it's look for those subtle messages and understand that propaganda the people- Propaganda is like a, a straw man. Well, we'll understand that the people that are writing this, they believe it's for your own good. It's not like they think, oh, we're going to fool them into doing it. Right. No, they think that this is a good way to be able to explain and illustrate good principles. And so, but just be aware that that is what's going on is that there's an ideological, there's an ideological influence behind what's going on. It's not just pure entertainment. Shannon right? Rice has an interesting question. It says, uh, so once you centralize ideology by nature, it will become ostracizing. So won't this eventually implode due to its own very nature? That's a really good question. Are we going to play the the portion where the interviewer asks Bezmanov what he thinks could happen to the Soviet Union? I, I don't I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you what. I like this. Because otherwise we should just answer it right here and now. Well, yeah, I think we probably should. Once you centralize ideology by nature, it will become ostracizing. So it's, yeah, the whole, if I understand the question right, it's all around this idea that once you've created you know, this, this particular ideology and centralized it and given it the power, anybody that is outside of it, it becomes ostracizing. You start, and one of the things that you actually see, so I, I don't think in, I don't think an ideology becoming centralized in, in the sense that, let's differentiate between popular and centralized. So centralized kind of has this idea that the ideology has taken over within maybe a political elite or within a power element within society. And therefore what it, what it seeks to do initially is convince you. But if it can't convince you, it then seeks to ostracize you or punish you in or some way. Or exterminate you well, in some of these that's systems. the final stage, right? The, the, first stage, the first stage tends to be um, we're, we're going to try to convince you. And then if we can't convince you, then we're going to try to ostracize you. And if we can't ostracize you, then we're going to try to eliminate you. Right. That, that's provided that you have an ideology which allows for that sort of transition uh, into a very, very violent approach. And obviously within the Soviet Union, it did. Hannah Arendt talks about this for, for those that are listening. If they want to look up somebody after the show, look up some of the writings of Hannah Arendt. She talks about how the, um, the, the these authoritarian systems demoralize their own people. Eventually, yeah. they're not and, to 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 Shannon's point. They're not sustainable long term. Yes. which is one of the reasons why within Marxist Leninist ideology they always talk about the revolutionary guard. 
Like you notice- The revolution we, will never end. We don't talk about the United States Army as the revolutionary army, even though when they were the Continental Army, that's what they were. Once we won the revolution, the revolution was over. That is not how it works with Marxist-Leninist ideology because Marx was so adamant about creating a new socialist man. Like they, they had to, they had to re envision and re, uh, you know, re envision what humanity actually was. And so the revolution can't stop. And one of the reasons why the revolution can't stop having enemies is because when socialism and communism fails to produce the social and economic promises that it was built upon when it sold it to people, right? It, it can't blame itself. It can't then come back and say, oh gosh, well, I guess we were wrong about that. Maybe, maybe private property works better. It can't do that. It has to create outside enemies or internal enemies, which are responsible for subverting the wonderful socialist process. This is why Cuba will always blame the United States yeah. for the failure of Marxism in Cuba. It's why North Korea always blames the United. This is why the whole America bad thing yeah. just exists. It is all always over our the fault. Internet. Always our fault. If a so, if and if there was no United States, it would be somebody else, or it would be counter revolutionaries within the country. It would be somebody. They must have a scapegoat yeah. in order to justify their own the ideology's own failures. Yeah. All right. So let's go. Let's go. Now he's, so we talked about demoralization. Let's talk about destabilization. Subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flabby, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, uh, what, what matters is essentials. Economy, foreign relations, defense systems. All right, pause right there. Um, so the, the next three ones that we're going to talk about, we're not going to spend as much time on because he didn't spend as much time on it. The big one was demoralization because it was 15 to 25 years is what he was saying. Essentials, economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Now think about that. With our own, within our own economy, we, we keep moving more and more away from free market capitalism, individual liberty, private property rights, and we keep moving more toward either cronyism, which is actually a, which is actually a fascist approach to economic policy, Fascists were big on the government running healthcare, education, academia, transportation, um, major infrastructure. They were okay with private entities owning certain industries, usually within a cartel system, which was done not only by Mussolini's Italy, not only by Hitler's Germany. It was pushed for a heavy under FDR during the Great Depression. He, he pushed for cartels. And what, it, what, what their system is, is they recognize that it's difficult for bureaucracies and, and politicians to run these industries. So they will allow the private sector to run them under a limited profit model, but they have to do so in accordance with government objectives because the government represents the people. So it's, it's important to understand that as you've seen the American economy move to becoming less and less free. In fact, if you look at the an index of economic freedom, that like Heritage Foundation, and, and yes, that's a conservative institution or other institutions, even libertarian institutions put out, what you find is the United States regularly stayed in the top 10. And now I think we're barely in the top 20. We might've actually moved out of the we top 20. We keep slipping. Because we keep moving to more of this cronyist system on one thing and more government control. But the one thing that crony is, this is why I always tell people there's no such thing as crony capitalism, right? There's, there's cronyism. Because capitalism is supposed to rely not just on the private ownership of the means of production, it's supposed to also rely on voluntary exchange. Mm -hmm. Well, if your company is entirely dependent upon government regulation or government subsidy for its survival, well, then now you're more of an extension of a government entity or essentially a planned economy than you are a market one. Because now a significant portion of your resources and your market share is coming through government dictates, not from consumers voluntarily choosing to do business with you. And so our, our supply chain is much more fragile. Well, and, and it seem? yes, and, and that's that's for a variety of reasons. But overall, within the economy, it's important to understand that we, we have moved more and more away from a free market economy. And you, you even saw Elizabeth Warren comes up today and says, the, pro, the reason why we've had another banking collapse is because they don't have enough oversight. Oh, okay, Liz, because when I think of fiscal responsibility and oversight, I think the federal government's done a bang up job, right? Because nothing wrong with the federal government's balance sheet. The yes. best run bank in the world is the Federal Reserve. Oh, God. They don't even have <laughs> oversight. We can't even get them to audit. So, so already we've seen 
this this movement from academ- academic theories that have moved into things like modern monetary theory, which has been devastating for monetary policy. It's which led to this push for more and more inflation. We've seen more government control over the economy. We see this with the WEF and stakeholder capitalism. It's this idea that, no, 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 it can't be private industry working. Private industry has to be working in accordance with these larger ESG objectives, right? Now, when it looks at our foreign relations, all of a sudden countries that used to be very, very close to the United States, either as trading partners or ideological partners, especially standing up against the Soviet Union. Now you see things like BRICS. Now you see things like France, which is a traditional U.S. ally, starting to get closer and closer to China at the expense of the relations with the United States. And this is for a couple of very simple reasons. One, the United States has been too heavily involved militarily around the world, I believe. But I think it's also been... it. If you can be involved heavily militarily, but you better you better actually make good on your promises. And instead, when you fight for 20 years in Afghanistan, promising that you're going to build this wonderful democratic state in Afghanistan, and instead you leave 20 years later putting back in power the people that ostensibly you fought to remove, what that suggests to your allies is, is you're not serious. You don't have long-term staying power. And I'm not suggesting we should have stayed in Afghanistan. I'm suggesting the way we went into Afghanistan in the first place should have been a very, very different mission statement than what we actually did. Degrading Taliban or terrorist military capacity made sense. Trying to create a parliamentarian democracy in a portion of the world that has never had parliamentarian democracy didn't make sense. We should have restored the monarchy in Afghanistan. That was so, the most stable government that they ever had before Dayud Khan overthrew it. Uh, so, so our economy has been degraded. Our foreign relations and our status in the world has been degraded, not, not eliminated. We're still considered a, a massive economic and military power, and we still have a lot of allies, but it's been degraded. And then our defense systems. Look no further than the way we're recruiting in the United States now. When, when you're telling me that a major component of your recruiting strategy is drag queens, when, when, you're, when you're telling me that the way that we're going to re- recruit for people in the military is by doing this little cartoon where it's all focused on marching for equity as a little girl and now, now I'm, I'm running a Patriot missile battery. Okay, <laughs> The, the way that you convince a younger generation to actually defend society and potentially to potentially die at the beginning of their life to, to uphold something <clears throat> is they have to be passionate with respect to the, the morals and the systems that they're actually defending and potentially putting their life on the line for. How do I know this? Because I did it. And did I always agree with U.S. foreign policy? Absolutely not. But I, do I still to this day take pride in wearing the uniform of my country and fight? Yes. Because at a fundamental level, I believed, and I still believe, in the goodness of the philosophy which built America. But if you've destroyed someone's belief in that philosophy because now you've convinced an entire generation that it was built upon racist and oppressive systems to uphold cisgendered white heteronormative men and their capitalist system at the expense of marginalized population, is that a system you're going to fight for? I'm telling you right now that the, we can build all the great weapon systems on the planet. We can have all the, the superior technology. If you don't got the people that are willing to fly the jets, hold the, hold the, the rifles, and man the tanks, because you have so demoralized society to believe in, like, what are we even fighting for? It's happened on the right, too. We did an episode. It's one of our best performing of all time about why Americans, a poll revealing that, that American society is coming apart at the seams. And I... I said something in that episode that has really stuck with me for a long time because you, you brought up that, you know, we've demoralized a whole generation of people on the left. We've also demoralized a lot of people on the right because the left believes that all of these institutions and indeed the United States itself is this inherently evil and oppressive colonial empire. It's, 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 it's just another Nazi Germany basically. Right. And, and it needs to be destroyed from within. And the right sees that the left has taken over every single one of our public and private institutions. Well, and so one side wants to tear down those institutions in the name of dismantling oppressive power structures. And the other side looks at these institutions and, and, and is coming to the conclusion that these are not worth fighting for. Mm-hmm. And it is devastating that the conservative forces in society, which by definition are the ones that historically stand up to defend and preserve existing institutions rather than advocate that they be torn down. And at, at worst, reform them, but certainly not just rip them out of the ground. So to, I, to quote Thomas Sowell, when we've gotten to a point where, where conservatives have, have made the, the decision that 
these aren't worth fighting for. And the left, meanwhile, is trying to destroy them. Yeah. The, the, the center will not hold. The, 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 entire, yeah. the, the, the edifice will, will come well, crumbling, and, and crumbling is, down. And this is the part, too. I, I already see the undermining of our foreign relations and defense systems, right? And, and I definitely see the undermining of our economy because the, the number one way to really devastate an economy is through inflation. If you, if you completely you know, lose trust in the currency, it is the quickest way to actually create massive crisis within a society. So let, let's go ahead and, and listen to the rest of this because pretty soon here he's also going to get to the, the next thing, which is crisis. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It okay, pause right here because normalization is the fourth point. Crisis, I think, is interesting. Um, obviously, the question is, is that if demoralization, if this process is 20 years for demoralization, five years for destabilization, and he thought in 1984 that the process was already overdone for demoralization, why haven't we hit destabilization and crisis yet? And I think the answer to that is twofold. I think it took it, it took longer than the initial estimates. That's I, I, my guess. I think that's one, but I, I think there's other there's two things going on right now. Is that the and that nobody's at the helm. The Soviet Union thought they were going to be at the helm to actually be there for the destabilization and crisis moment, and they weren't, right? Like their system was, even though they had a good plan for demoralizing a, a foreign system, their own system couldn't stand the test of time because their ideology is what they were, they were trying to demoralize and, and, and replace that demoralized thing through crisis with their ideology, but their ideology couldn't stand the test of time because it was repressive, because it was inefficient, because it didn't deliver on promises. This goes back to what I was saying about the train kept going down the tracks, but there was no conductor at yeah. the helm. So now we're, we're at a point where the demoralization is continuing. You need to understand this is not something where the demoralization just stops because if the same people that you've demoralized are now the college professors or the school teachers or whatever else, or the politicians or the media stars or the movie stars, or the singers, well, then, of course, the demoralization continues, right? And then you get the destabilization, which I think is happening at a faster pace now than it's ever happened in our, in our lifetime. And we've even got some signs of crisis. And, and that's where the, when, when we start talking about problems with, again, we, we've talked about this forum, will the dollar collapse? And the problem is, is that the Fed raising interest rates was actually the proper thing to do in order to combat inflation. The problem is, is there's no political will to continue to do it. And you can point to no other greater example than once again, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who is kind of one of the intellectual, I mean, AOC is a mouthpiece. Bernie Sanders talks about this from a populist standpoint. Senator Elizabeth Warren has tried to hold herself up as I think is kind of like the intellectual advocate for this, while everyone else is kind of more of a populist approach, even though she also uses populist approaches as well. But this this whole idea of like, the Fed is the one causing this by raising interest rates. And if they would just lower the, once again, we're moving back to an inflationary economy the moment you do that. And if you move back to an inflationary economy, you will get a temporary spike right in the stock market. And they'll be able to point to that and say, see, look, but then what will end up happening is with inflation, with other problems, you're going to see more banks collapse. You will see more industries collapse. And what will Elizabeth Warren say then? Will Elizabeth Warren say, oh, I guess I was wrong with respect. She'll blame capitalism. She'll blame capitalism. And guess what her solution will be? We need more government control and regulation of these industries to provide stability. Guess what else she'll do right. if you lower interest rates and you reinflate the everything bubble? She'll blame capitalism. Yep. She'll say this is an example of capitalism exacerbating income inequality. We need more government look regulation. At, look we at need all more these taxes. profits that are being pulled in by the people at the top isn't at it, the expense of workers. It, isn't it incredible how no matter what happens, yeah. bubble gets reinflated and we have another decade of uninterrupted growth like we did the previous one, or we get a hyperinflationary debt crisis. Either one, she's immediately going to blame capitalism Either direction. Because, because her objective is greater state control, which means greater Elizabeth Warren control. Because remember, she's a good person. It's all you greedy capitalists out there that don't want to pay your taxes. It's all you people that have internalized the racism of your system. And she's going to be the savior. Her and her ideological allies are going to be the savior. That way, she encourages the bubble to explode and go up. Capitalism. 
She encourages the bubble, bubble to be flat. Capitalism. Because she's already made up her mind what the solution is. That's what he was talking about. There is no way to intellectually explain to her that her ideology and political philosophy is in part responsible for the very things that she's railing against because that couldn't be true. She's the good person. It has to be other people's faults. She's on the right side of history. She's on the right side of history. And so, yes, destabilization and crisis doesn't hurt her ideology. It puts it on the fast track to implementation. And, and do I think she's doing this as some sort of like, you know, you know, undermining subversive? No, I think she honestly, she is a true believer. And that's why if she ever got her way. She does so with the approval of her own conscience. Yeah, the C.S. Lewis quote. And that's yeah. why even when she gets her own way, she's going to find out very quickly. She will no longer be as useful as she thinks she is once she actually gets what she wants. So that's the crisis point, right? The crisis could come from, like in the United States, if I were to have to like predict crisis right now, it wouldn't be from a foreign power coming and invading. We have these two things called the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, which makes it impossible to like militarily subvert the United States. But we can do it through ourselves through a combination of demoralization and monetary crisis, which leads to fiscal crisis, which leads to everybody going, somebody come in and give us a solution. And lo and behold, the people that want more government control, the people that want less private ownership, those people will all convince you that you, wanting control over your own money, your own business, wanting you to be able to protect yourself with your own guns, that's greedy and self-servicing. And, and you're putting the individual up, up above the collective at, at, at the expense of everyone. And so you're the problem now. And you will continue to be the problem as long as you have a voice to speak about it. Now, once they actually, now if they do ever get to the point where they can actually have that sort of control over the economy and education and everything else, y your ability to speak about it is going to be surveil severely curtailed. And we've already seen through COVID the model that they'll do it. So don't tell me that the First Amendment will be the one thing standing in the way of them being able to do all this. They're trying to chip away at that right now with everything in them. And, and again, they do so with the approval of their own conscience. All right, let's talk to the last, the last part here. And then yeah, we'll kind of wrap up. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kind of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C. with the benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. He will go to Moscow to kiss the bottoms of, of new generation of Soviet assassins, never mind. He will create false illusions that the uh, situation is under control. Situation is not under control. Situation is disgustingly out of control. Most of the American politicians, media, and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peacetime. False. The United States is in the state of war. Pause. Undeclared total. So he goes on to say, undeclared total war. Now, again, keep in mind, this, I love is, everything he's saying this is when the Soviet Union was still in power and still considered by many to be kind of at the height of their power. Um, this is during the Reagan administration. So I, I think it's important to understand what he's saying here is that, I mean, look at what he's talking about. He's, he, he, he's saying Walter Mondale is not going to come over and be like, all right, now we're the Union of Soviet, you know, we're the American uh, Soviet Socialist Republic, <laughs> right? He's not saying that. It's no, I'm going to promise you a bunch of things, regardless of whether or not they're, they, I can deliver on them. Put in big brother government. Yeah, if I, if I can't deliver on them, it's the fault of greedy capitalists who don't want to pay their fair share or participate in the greater system because they're too focused on their individual freedoms as opposed to the larger freedom of the collective. Right? Does any of this sound nuts? I mean, is any of this something you haven't heard people, prominent people within politics actually say with a straight face? It's sad that it doesn't sound very nuts anymore. It actually sounds... Like what we've been hearing. I mean, all through COVID, we heard that type of stuff where it's like, well, the mask doesn't protect you. It protects everybody else. Yeah. You better mask up. And if you don't, you want grandma to die. Yeah. And no. now it comes back that, oh, well, that was all pretty much a lie. CDC came out and is basically saying, or 
Fauci says none of it actually did anything. Yeah. I mean, and we're, but I still see people out there virtue signaling with those masks. Yeah. Well, so Life in a Nutshell asks, why do you think, what do you think caused the inflationary economy right now? Printing trillions of dollars. And, and, and that's, you said right now. Right now it's printing trillions of dollars, which, which again, largely happened during the Trump administration and during COVID. There, there was huge political pressure to print money so that we wouldn't see absolute economic collapse in the midst of, one, a supply chain issues, but primarily government insistence that the way to stop everything was essentially shutting down the world economy. Which, which, despite the fact that you had leading epidemiologists saying that is not the right way to go, we still insist. Now, Trump did it for a relatively short period of time. The Democrats wanted to do it for a much longer period of time. They attacked him for not doing it enough. Yeah, so, so like, let, let's keep this in perspective. While yeah. I disagree with some of the things the Trump administration did. I mean, they'll definitely he, say it was the other way around. Yeah, he, he, was, he was operating. You know, well, you see this now with Randy Weingartner from the teachers unions getting out and saying, we desperately fought to open schools. That is a they lie. They to keep fought them tooth and nail. They called us racist for wanting to open them the, back the up. The Chicago Teachers Union said the push to reopen schools is rooted in white supremacy and racism. They lit and sexism too. I believe they said that yeah. too. They they literally said the push to reopen schools is rooted in white supremacy, racism, yeah. and sexism. But it, it, and, it, and we're supposed to. Oh, by the way, they deleted that tweet. Yeah. We're supposed to ignore that. Yeah. And, and, I mean, it, it gets back into the whole. You're never supposed to know what's actually true and what's not yeah. and it gets into the demoralization and it thing. doesn't matter how much evidence you show people i will get told nobody wants to do that or you're a liar that's not actually happening okay well here's all the evidence that it is actually happening can i no, also say no it isn't i don't how am i supposed to here's what's so dangerous about that okay it used to be that what the one one of the the hallmarks of our culture was there was such a thing as objective truth. And so therefore, if I show sufficient evidence, you either have to admit you're wrong or admit I'm right or modify your statement or find a, a countervailing argument or evidence to, to refute what I'm saying. Now I can show you evidence. You can look at the evidence, look me dead in the eye and be like, you're a racist. If there is no way for you and I to peacefully adjudicate differences through discussion, argumentation, and agreed upon set of principles through the laws of logic and the presentation of evidence, how are we supposed to adjudicate differences? You don't. That's where we get to the extermination process, apparently. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean like social extermination, basically cancellation. And not only that, but like you look at this and you go, man, you can see that Newspeak is in full swing and people are told you believe this you believe x y and z even though it's a, don't believe your own eyes it's actually this way i mean this is definitely straight out of 1984 the mass gaslighting of the american yeah. people well and, and again there's been questions on is was inflation really a bad thing yes inflation is a bad thing now you you could make arguments in the monetarists with like Milton Friedman and whatnot will say that you know a limited amount of inflation over time isn't bad provided the productivity and wages are remaining high if you look at the Austrian school they'll say that no the problem is is that when you have a central bank that can arbitrarily print fiat currency that you're always going to have a situation where the government will seek to manipulate that process because there will always come a time where they can't borrow anymore they can't tax anymore and so the the inclination to uh, print is overwhelming especially when you have massive unfunded entitlement programs such as medicaid medicare and social security which people rely upon for their livelihood so when when people ask what's the source of the current inflation massive printing of federal reserve notes what's the long-term reason why we have inflation a combination of the federal reserve a combination of going off of the gold standard and, and people say oh you want to go back to trading gold no i'm not saying you gotta have gold to buy a loaf of bread i'm saying that if your fiat currency your paper money is not tied to some sort of, of entity with inherent intrinsic worth, right? You're going to have a problem where people will just print it off. And that's where we're at right now. So it, it, it is, yeah. And Frederick Bastiat did a lot of great work on, on the whole idea of everything from uh, inflationary monetary policy to uh, free trade and, and all of those things. Okay. Let's, um, let me see. I think we're all, we're it's almost time. at the end. I of think this. we're at the end now. Yeah. So let, let's go. So we've talked about the crisis. There's one more point that you wanted to bring up in a separate clip. So, so everything we've talked about is like really depressing. Let's be honest, right? I, I mean, it, it 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 sounds like there's no hope, and I've I've been reading some of the comments, and there's there's lots of fighting, like Christian, usual. Are comments, you about but to offer a hope. little glimmer of hope? I'm very pessimistic. How unlike but you? No, no, I'm 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 very pessimistic, but I I do think that. 
it's in the big picture, I'm not pessimistic. Um, in the in the short and medium term, I'm very pessimistic. But I think Besmanov provides one potential avenue, arguably the most important avenue, um, in order to overcome this. And it's it's about two minutes long. I I think we should just play it. Yeah, and then, let, let's and then play we'll it. This this is just a yeah a great sum up of 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 how do you respond to this? Like okay. Provided that we've made a good argument, that Yuri has made a good argument, that yes, that there was there were outside forces that were interested in making this happen with the United States, but there were a lot of forces also within the United States that believe in the in the fundamental principles of Marxist Leninist ideology, and this was the way. And you see people like Gramsci that they thought this was the most effective way to to push this sort of ideology. And, and I don't, I think we've provided sufficient evidence, both within Yuri, Gramsci, and, and the arguments that we've made that this has absolutely been happening. Um, whether you want to say it's a direct result of active measures or something else, I think there's a good argument to be made that the, the, the process for active measures makes logical sense. And now, as, as like Yuri kind of explained all this, he talked about like, so how do you beat it? <laughs> how do you beat it? All right, here we go. Knowledge may not. All the sophisticated technology and computers will not prevent society from disintegrating and eventually dying out. Have you ever met a person who would sacrifice his life, freedom, for the truth like that? <laughs> so for those on the audio, it's two times two equals four. And so the question he's asking is, okay, here's the truth. Two times two equals four. Do you know anybody that would die for it? Go ahead. This is truth. I never met a person who said, this is truth and I'm ready to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> to defend the truth. Right? But millions sacrifice their life, freedom, comfort, everything for things like God. Like Jesus Christ. It's an honor. Some martyrs in, in the Soviet concentration camp died. And they died in peace, unlike those who shouted, long live Stalin, knowing perfectly well that he may not live long. <laughs> something, which is, something which is not material moves society and helps it to survive. And the other way around. The moment we turn into two by two is four and make it a guiding principle of our life, our existence, we die. Even though this is true and this we cannot prove. We only can feel and have faith in it. So the answer to ideological subversion, strangely enough, is very simple. You don't have to shoot people. You don't have to aim mi missiles and Pershings and cruise missiles at Andropov's headquarters. You simply have to have faith and prevent subversion. In other words, not to be a victim of subversion. Don't try to be a person who in Zudo is trying to smash your enemy and being caught by your hand. Don't strike like that. Strike with the power of your spirit and moral superiority. If you don't have the power, it's high time to develop it. And that's the only answer. That's it. Thank you. Um, I, when, he, when he talks about it's weird because we, we've even been taught to believe that the concept of moral superiority is wrong. Yeah. And, and we've been taught to believe it by people that believe their system is morally superior. Right. You see this all the time with people that say, don't judge. Well, they don't mean don't judge because you're judging me for judging the act of the act of saying don't judge is to use one's judgment. And the only reason why you're using one judgment is because you believe that one approach to a particular problem is morally superior than the other. But once again, we find ourselves in another situation where they will push forward an inherently contradictory self-defeating statement. And we're sitting here screaming at the top of our lungs, but that's logically inconsistent. It can't work. Well, it works for the moment. It works for them until it doesn't. And then they just move on to something else. And we're sitting there constantly chasing them around the table going, wait, no, no, that doesn't make sense. That's wrong. That's an approach. You know what? Stop chasing. Stop chasing. 
At this point, I become more and more convinced that I'm just going to stand on the truth rather than chasing every single lie that comes across. Because if I stand on the truth and I do it correctly, it will affect the way that I treat my wife, the way I treat my children, the way I treat my friends, the way I treat my coworkers. It will manifest itself in success in life in ways that are indisputable. It will provide that moral framework that I didn't create, but that was given to us by God. And the results will speak for themselves so much so that even in the midst of defeat, as he mentioned, watching martyrs stand up in a concentration camp and say, I know who I serve. And I know who created me. And I can go in peace. This is why in Philippians it doesn't talk about the peace which is perfectly understandable because of ideal situations. It talks about the peace which surpasses all understanding. Well, the only way it can surpass all understanding if there's no discernible reason why it should make sense with everything going on. And that more than ever, I have become absolutely convinced is a solution for what we're facing right now. It's not that we can stop pointing out the lies, but my gosh, if we're not then pointing to the truth of the genuine article, then what are we asking people to give up? And what are we asking them to adopt? This is why we call it making the argument rather than identifying the lie, right? Because at, at the end of the day, part of the problem, and I've come to, to really believe this over the past couple of years, part of the problem is not that we haven't done a good enough job identifying all the instances where the left are hypocritical or all the instances where the left's policies are flawed or, or incorrect. We haven't done a good enough job advocating for the truth rather than fighting against lies. And part of the reason that, that we have this show, making the argument, is for you to make the argument, not necessarily against what the left says, although we certainly provide tons of evidence on that front too, but, but to provide evidence for why the principles that we believe in are worth fighting for and not just worth fighting for, but are true and will lead to, 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 to great benefit for, for everybody. Well, and, and I, I think that to some degree, and, and again, we, we don't agree with everything that Bezmanov says, but, but, but I, I think to some degree Bezmanov understood that. And, and unfortunately he passed away 30 years ago in 1993. So he's, he's not around to see what's going on today. I'd be really curious to, to pick his brain and figure out what he would think about this world today. But I, I do think that, that the end of this lecture here, he really speaks to a lot of truth in terms of the way that you defeat, here's an example, the way that you defeat the Soviet system is not fighting against it with physical force. The Soviet Union collapsed without a shot being fired. The Eastern Bloc fell outside of Romania. The Eastern Bloc fell every single one of those countries without a shot being fired. The Berlin Wall fell without tanks bulldozing it. The Soviet Union itself disintegrated because people joined hands for hundreds of miles through the Baltic states, because people stood in front of tanks during the August coup of 1991, because people took to the streets and protested, but not because people violently overthrew their own government. It's because people gave up on that government decades before, and the system collapsed in on itself because it had become rotten to its core. And... It's incredible that most people, even the people that were able to accurately predict the Soviet Union would collapse, most people thought if the Soviet Union was going to collapse, it was going to be in violent civil war. It was going to be a bloodbath. It, it would be another Holocaust. It would be another Eastern Front. And that's not what happened. The Soviet Union fell with almost nobody shedding blood in the process. And I think the only reason that that was able to happen was because of some of the stuff that Bezmanov just talked about here in his conclusion. Well, and I, and I think I, I've, I've argued about this before with people when he talks about the moral superiority. Regardless of when someone says about that term, we all understand that moral superiority exists. Certain actions are morally superior to other actions. Saving a life is morally superior than to murdering one, murdering somebody. Like, we get that. We automatically understand it. The argument that I've started to make for a lot of the things that I believe in, and the, and the reason, what I, what I think he said there was so powerful, he goes, nobody dies for two plus two equal, or two times two equals four. Nobody dies for that. But look at the way that conservatives argue for individual liberty. Look at the way that conservatives argue for the Constitution. Look at the way that conservatives argue for Second Amendment rights. Look at the way that conservatives argue for free market economics. Free market economics will make you richer. Individual liberty gives you more choices. You, know, you have a right to own guns so you can protect yourself against the government. Okay, those are all true. 
And some of those things may be worth dying for on some level, but you want to know why I support free market economics? Because there's something inherently moral about each person getting to use their own property, talents, and time in order to create the sort of economic life that they would like. And by contrast, there is something deeply immoral about a government agency coming in and telling them, you're not allowed to do that. I don't care if it's a king or a congressman. I don't care if you got to vote for it or you didn't. Someone coming in and telling you, I will decide what options you have because I, as the benevolent government entity, will decide for you because I am smarter than you and I have your best interest in mind. That is not morally superior to saying that, yes, everyone will have choices to make about what they're going to do and how they fit into the exchange with other people so that we're all making each other's lives better, not just through competition, but through cooperation. I believe in the moral superiority of individual liberty at the expense of government control because I believe you're created in the image of God. And even if you want to make decisions that I don't necessarily agree with, I think you should be allowed to do that. And I think it is immoral for me to use force and coercion to tell you that you can't unless you're infringing on the rights and liberties of other people to do the same thing. I don't believe that first and foremost because I believe it achieves better practical outcomes, even though I think that's absolutely true. I believe it because it's built upon a fundamental moral premise which is superior to the socialist, communist, Marxist, Leninist model, whatever sort of adjective you want to put on it or other descriptor. Oh, no, it's democratic socialism. Oh, good. So 50% plus one of the civilization can now vote to impose their will in almost every aspect of an individual's life because you guys think it's better. Now, you can stand on that, and you might be able to make a practical argument for it, although I think history is going to prove you wrong but it will be morally fraud from the beginning of the statement. And it's about time we call out the absolute moral bankruptcy of these inherently coercive systems. I'm going to start arguing more and more for the moral supremacy of what we're talking about because it values individual human beings because it values their liberties and their choices. And it also accepts that there is such a thing as objective truth And consequences are going to take place and people should be allowed to adjust to those consequences without some government entity coming in from the outside asserting itself in almost every situation in our lives with respect to how we raise our kids, how we run our businesses, or how we worship, or how we just make basic decisions. And will that yield perfect results? No, because people are flawed. But if the inherent flaws that we find in people is too dangerous to give them liberty, well, then it sure as hell is too dangerous to give a select few power. And that's the real trade-off that we're talking about here. So I want to thank you guys all for watching. Thank you for the questions you got. I think we got to most of them. We might have missed a few if we did. Come back next episode or or let us know in the comments. But we can't thank you enough for, for your feedback, for you watching. We hope you got a lot out of this episode. Again, if you want to find out more about how to see these lectures, you can just go on YouTube, Yuri Bezmanov. Very easy to find. Uh, the interview that he did in 1984 that we talked and the, uh, the larger discussion that he had here, a lecture that he gave in 1983. There's also more data. I want to hand it over to Hamilton. I think yep. it's got some closing I, notes as well that are necessary. I will place all the links to the videos from today's episode in the description as soon as we wrap up here. And if you have any questions that we didn't get to, like Nick said, you can drop them in the comments here on YouTube. But we would love to hear them in our community chat, which you can join at the link in the description. And we'll have everybody in our community jump into that conversation and discuss that topic as well. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. And we will see you next episode.